Okay. Okay, so here's chapter one. Um, and this is the emergency care as far as what our system is, what our, our, not just on a national, but a state and a local level, um, how we kind of fit in to the emergency services. And we really actually as EMTs kind of set the stage for a lot of of, of interaction with a bunch of different professionals from law enforcement, fire service. Um, and you may end up you're end up in fire service. Um, we like to be able to participate in research, so we use evidence based guidance when it comes to doing any of our practices now and from now on. We actually can help in public health, and there are some. Things called mobile integrated healthcare, community paramedicine. I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, considering Riverside County's first program um, in community-based paramedic, and that's a kind of exciting that you're going to want to kind of see. Uh, they like to do case studies and talk about case studies. Um, and for example, they're talking about this person here that's um, they're um, you know a little bit overweight. They're um, a diabetic, they're 51, which they may or may not have, you know, some advanced disease processes. And in this case study, um, they're trying to get you to look at the whole patient. Uh, and now this patient is a lot of times having some type of medical issue. So they're breaking out to a sweat, they collapse, um, and now you get on scene and have to do the assessment as an emergency medical technician. Um, in some places, actually in many places of the United States, um, EMTs work with another EMT and are considered also first responders. And they will start off the assessment and treatment and call in a paramedic when they need them. In this state, we um, typically run uh, paramedic EMT or two paramedics that respond to incidents. So it really depends on the type of area that you're working in. So they're asking you about well, what part of the system, you know, this guy's going to get his help from, and that's you, the first responder, the EMS system. Um, the weakness in the system they're talking about, um, and which hopefully you'll read about if you haven't read um, the first chapters yet, first three chapters, could be many different things from um, getting um, a first responder um, instead of an EMT or getting a delay in um, response to that patient if they're overwhelmed in their system. So what you're here for is what's on the left, meaning the big kind of orange is the color I see it as, sudden loss of life and disability from catastrophic accidents and illness, that's a major problem. And you're gonna respond to these types of problems, whether it's a major illness, as in sudden cardiac arrest, sudden stroke, accidents, I mean, motor vehicle accidents, or some type of uh, terrorist event. The EMS really, as far as um, where it came from, developed out of war and lessons learned in war, meaning Korea, Vietnam. And it was physicians who actually started not just the theory of how EMS would work, but they took it from the battlefield and brought it in civilian um, sector for us to use. And even to today, we still learn and get a lot of what we do from the military. And <clears throat> if you look at these different units, um, there's been quite a change throughout um, the EMS system from the 1970s um, to today where a lot of the units are considered mobile intensive care units, um, also mobile, mobile functional units that are not just, they, they're 
ambulances and rescues, meaning they have certain equipment for extrication, usually light extrication, um, and it depends on who is on that unit. Um, the more rescue ambulance combination is usually in fire service. And in some places, only EMTs are working on the ambulances and they don't have any rescue equipment and very limited protective equipment. So it really depends on, you know, what you're doing as far as your EMS system. And it's slowly improving. So you, as far as, as, far as modern EMS, if you're asked a question, you know, what really what your role is, is to get them from the scene into an emergency department trying to keep them alive and your care really will follow through through the hospital discharge and rehabilitation. How you make a difference in this is that you um, provide um, stabilization and breathing when they're not breathing. Um, you may have a, a cardiac arrest rate of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so good high quality CPR, which all, all of you should know. And the uh, teaching uh, skills instructors tomorrow and maybe Thursday will be testing you and going over making sure that you have those skills because you're going to apply those skills in the hospital situation and in and maybe even in your ride out on the ambulance or on the fire truck. So we really want you to be pretty dialed with that. And here's again history associated with why we're at. Um, why we're where we're at right now as far as an EMS system. It's because all these different uh, uh, acts and papers and research and then more acts and, and in some cases um, support from the Department of Transportation and NHTSA, uh, the National Highway Safety Tra Tra Traffic Administration. There, So you have all of these entities saying we really need to um, – EMS is um, flourishing and expanding their role in taking care of people and getting them to the hospital in one piece. Now, if you're asked about a document on the National Registry, some of the most important documents are the EMS Agenda for the Future and the National EMS Scope of Practice Model, because what we are really functioning other the EMS agenda for the future and then the national EMS scope of practice. Okay, so the Institutes of Medicine, um, again, they're basically there for research and what they do is look at the EMT programs, the different programs from first responder to paramedic, and they go in and make recommendations for, for what the curriculum should be, they assist with that, and prerequisites for each level, what each level really should be consist of, and how they interrelate. So the four levels now that exist um, are basically there to, to build off of from the first responder clear to the paramedic. So when you're a paramedic, you have such rich, deep, and solid skill sets that when you're on a paramedic unit, um, again, you make a really big difference. But each part of the chain has its job. For example, if you you become a paramedic and you're receiving the care from an EMT, you should expect that care, you should have that care set or skill set and that EMTs that you receive the patient from should have delivered that patient with those skill sets completed for you. And then you push on the other additional skill sets on that patient. For, for example, more advanced drugs, more advanced procedures like endotracheal intubation or using um, uh, glidoscope scope, scope uh, endoscopy to, to put an airway into the patient. So it's really interesting how they're building this system and it's not really done yet. There's a lot more um, um, that'll be going on here. Now, just take a look at the 10 components really quickly. Um, these are the components that NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 
says should be part of the system. You have medical direction, which is a physician, trauma systems, and then we evaluate the system. Um, and then we look at the system, which is actually right now, I was just involved in some evaluation and we're gonna be looking at um, implementing more or being able to put together um, a bigger um, community-based paramedic um, system which will be an offshoot of the paramedics that work on ambulances and on fire trucks. Well, they'll actually be doing other stuff a little bit above their scope of practice. And I'll get into that a little bit more towards the end because it's pretty exciting for you and what you're going to be doing in the next five and 10 years in the field of EMS. Okay, so clinical or oversight and clinical practice, um, what we want is in EMS is to be cost efficient or economically efficient. We wanna be accountable for what we do and everything that we do, um, that our quality of service is on par with everyone else, that we have a good um, quality of service, that our clinical expertise has good quality to it, meaning um, your intubation rate, your um, CPR and the quality of that, and then we want to, once we, you know, evaluate all that, be able to do improvements in the system and build a system that's resilient. In the past, what I started out, it was pretty, uh, pretty cowboyish, pretty uh, loose system. Um, and we didn't have a lot of research that backed when we started out, um, what we did as far as pre-hospital care. In-hospital had a lot, so we were stealing stuff out of the in-hospital experience. It doesn't always transmit into the out into the field, and we'll, we'll get to that more towards the end. So common way almost everybody knows in the system is 911. Um, that's in our system here. Um, that's still not true throughout the whole United States, believe it or not. So in our system here, we start off 911. Now we have what's called enhanced 911. Um, and in that, if you get a, a dispatcher, for example, it goes to county fire, they will actually, um, not only will they dispatch um, to your location, so if you can't speak, if you're on a, a hard line at a home, um, they'll know exactly where you're at. If you're on a cell phone in Murrieta, they will know where you're at because of this enhanced system that they have. And they will be able to give directions to whoever's on that line to help that person through their medical or trauma crisis. Meaning, you know, this is how you control bleeding, or this is how you do mouth to mouth, or this is how you do chest compressions. And that's a big deal because everyone thinks that is all over the place and it's not. For example, the only ones that are doing enhanced right now is County Fire and Riverside City and Corona, and they're not, only county fire is fully functional where they'll actually give people directions over the phone. The others do very limited um, enhancement. Um, Murrieta Fire, um, Hemet Fire, um, fire uh, Palm Spring Fire, there's a ton of fire departments that don't even have this. Um, they just have standard dispatch, and we're going to it, at least our department is, in about five months. So this is standard, um, what a, a communications would look like. You have usually one dispatcher with typically four CRTs or um, um, screens to look at. One of them is a map and the rest of it's call, call taking and then how you respond to calls. But I mean, this is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, our dispatch looks like this. But the only thing they don't have is they don't have right now is the enhanced system of giving directions. So 911 is easy to remember and you get everything you need. Fire, police, EMS, whatever you need, law enforcement. Just remember that cell phones, on, in some areas, they can figure out where you're at geographically. Um, they're all, it's becoming more and more prevalent where they'll triangulate where you're at. Um, for the longest time, it was only Hemet and about four other um, cities in the United States that had it. 
So what happens is they, you call, it triangulates where you're at, and they can get right, I mean, within a foot or two of you with this system. So again, it's it's still evolving. So if you're on a cell phone and you're calling something in, it's really behooves you to know where you're at, the address, or the location that somebody can say, hey, I'm at um, Target in Marietta, and it's a huge one, and next door is Tractor Supply. Um, but in Hemet, I mean, you know, that's what you'd have to do because we don't have the enhance there. Okay, so voice over internet, or this is, again, voice over internet is um, part of it. You can use that, but again, must give a physical location because anytime you move where you're at, um, you get a different, uh, you may have a different address. That's how it was explained to me, kind of like, what is this? Voice over internet protocol. So um, so you go into it, you say, yeah, I live at this address, but if you move, then you have to somehow tell it you, you're at this other address. So pretty interesting. So here's another one of the case studies. Um, so Sarlene went waitress in a restaurant, pulls out a cell phone, her pocket dials 911. Transfers the call to a trained EMT dispatcher or an EMS dispatcher, showing a series of questions. Now, so she's going to ask about monitoring Ben's condition, you know, until help arrives. So she's going to want to ask questions, get an idea what Ben, this sounds like he's a diabetic, you know, what's going on with him. Okay. So, the reason they're asking those questions to give us a better idea before we arrive, that means you arrive, before you arrive of what you might be getting yourself into. And we just had a call um, yesterday um, that was really, uh, whew, it was really a, a high risk, um, high priority call. And this all plays into it, what I'm talking about. And the bullet point is right almost in the middle says communications. Um, that's one of probably the most important components is communications of what's going on at the scene. What happened? Our guys got dispatched to this place. Oops, sorry. I got dispatched to this place. Um, it's supposed to be a full arrest, 12 people there, and then the patient and a couple other relatives. Um, they get on scene. This guy's got what they call excited delirium. And you'll we'll learn about that, or you will. Um, and uh, a lot of times it's caused by um, somebody that's on certain types of drugs, and he's totally out of control. And he's threatened to kill people. He went after a weapon. So the problem in the communications is our, our guys at the scene with their HTs could not communicate with dispatch. Somehow dispatch communication went down. So finally they went to cell phone to get some help. The 12 guys that were there, people broke out in a big fight. So now you got a big fight for all these people in the street next to the ambulance and the fire truck. And inside this guy with excited delirium. Well, excited delirium, if anyone's ever heard of anyone on PCP and how strong they are and they go all wild, that's the kind of guy they're dealing with. So this scene was totally a mess and totally unsafe. So communications, super important. So using their cell phone, luckily they have that as a backup. And I always preach that. Medical direction comes in two flavors, online and offline. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. And all these different components here, if they're working right, gives you a healthy EMS system. Okay. So... Here's another case study. I'm gonna go past this case study just a second. Um, and they, what they have is an anxious customer that holds open the front door um, at the restaurant. You look around and grab your equipment, head for the door. But anyway, what they're trying to get at in, in this is anytime you get into a scene, you look in and make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. So, When you're at a scene and you're coming into whatever it is, a business, a home, it's super important that your scene safety is 
uh, above everything else. You can't do anything if a door slams on your hand or somebody, you know, somebody's out of control and, and hurts you. You're not going to perform well when you've been assaulted or injured in some way. So just it's not like in the movies where you see them running with their cases of equipment and stuff. That's the worst thing you can do is run. You know, you can fat walk fast, bring your equipment in, but you better have your eyes and ears open. You need to have all your senses. OK. So your how you appear and what you're doing is always perceived by everyone in the public. You all already know now that everybody has a cell phone or taking pictures on these scenes. I'll explain a little bit of what happens in the Hemet area right now, but it's pretty, pretty interesting. And just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing your ride along there. So our system is a fire-based EMS system in Hemet, and we have um, private EMS um, backing us up. So fire EMS and private EMS, we teamwork together. So Hemet Fire and AMR are a team, and um, they uh, work very well together. They've been doing it for a lot of years, and both have paramedics on them. And the reason for that is, is if you get into a system that becomes overwhelmed, which can happen very easily, then if all the ambulances are tied up, at least you have the fire department that can go out and start ALS training or ALS, excuse me, care. Until an ambulance can get there to transport. Um, you will see this on your ride outs because you're going to be out there riding along in the height of flu season and in... Um, and it's going to be pretty, you're going to be pretty, uh, have a lot, of, lot to do, uh, both in the hospital and on the ambulance or even on the fire truck. So it's a really great experience for you. Okay. And then hospital-based EMS systems, they're back east. Municipal EMS-based systems, most of those are back east. And law enforcement EMS systems, those are back east. So really on California is unique in there. It's really fire, private EMS-based whereas all the rest of those are back east. So the levels of providers I was talking about earlier and how the National and Department of Transportation have broken them up and they keep adding to them. So at the bottom is the EMR. Know that there are about 60 hours of training. The e emergency medical technician varies from state to state uh, and from area to area, ours is 205. Uh, a minimum in some states is 160, maximum in some states are 300 hours. So it really depends. Advanced DMT is 480 hours, and then paramedic minimum is 1,200 hours. So that means that much of training before you, you know, can take the national test and then get out and start functioning as a paramedic. So, and each level builds on the other level, which is very unique. So our system, um, basically, we're kind of extend extensions from the hospital um, and used to be called, you know, we're the extension of the physicians and the emergency department. We call it pre-hospital care or out-of-hospital care. Most areas use pre-hospital care. And it means that when EMTs transport, we make the decision and medics um, we make the decision based on the system of where that patient's gonna gonna go. You might have a trauma patient, you have to take a trauma center, a burn patient to a burn center, an OB patient to an OB center. Um, not all hospitals have OB services. Um, and, and, you know, and that's probably gonna be a surprise to most of you. Because I used to think, well, yeah, all hospitals. Well, no, a lot of hospitals now have gotten rid of them and are doing other things. And they let the next hospital next to them um, do the OB services while they do something else like pediatric services. So, for example, Menifee Hospital and in Inland don't do OB. It's um, Hemet Hospital or um, Rancho Springs, which have radies, um, specialized internists there for babies and newborns. So we have all these different centers here. So take an opportunity to see what each one is about and what they are more in depth. So this is exactly what it looks like when you have a trauma center 
and you come in and bring a trauma patient in. So they call level A or level B trauma. This is what you're going to get. And there are actually probably a couple more people behind them that you can't see. So you wheel the patient on the gurney, you put them on their bed. They look at you and they say, go to the corner with your gurney and stay right there. Do not leave. And what will happen is they will quiz you on this patient. They won't do it right away, maybe, uh, but they will start quizzing you about what went on with this patient, you know, how they present, you know, what happened to them exactly. So you as an EMT can still provide them with some very valuable information that will um, help that patient to survive. And EMTs <clears throat> actually work with the medics. It's part of the team. I already told you that you have first responder, EMT, advanced EMT, and medic. Um, this whole chain works together for that patient survival. To work a cardiac arrest, these are the amount of people you should have there. One, two, three, four, five. Five people. And the reason for that is there's a lot of tasks. And then the manual cardiopulmonary resuscitation, um, if you haven't, you know, gathered, is can be pretty um, a pretty good workout. Um, and they every two minutes, they want you to switch because they've already proven that if you go over two minutes, you push not quite as deep as you're supposed to. And that's why you give everybody a shot at it to do the cardiopulmonary resuscitations. If you don't do it right, your outcome for your patient um, is not going to be good at all. As a matter of fact, it's going to be a much higher mortality rate if you don't do it right. So just remember, we interface with all EMS interface together, um, many different departments, um, fire, EMS, CHP, Sheriff's Department, local city, PD, even um, National Park Service, Department, Bureau of Land Management, and Border Patrol. Um, even the S FBI, if you're on special teams like I was. So, so Ben determines the problem, nature of Ben's problem. The EMTs head towards the closest hospital, which is 35 minutes. Um, so they have a par paramedic unit meet them. So Ben's problems are probably look revolving around hypoglycemia or some other diabetic problem. Just think of how you would request, you know, a paramedic intercept. Um, again, communications is super important. If you're not able to contact them with your regular radio, then you would have to use a cell phone. So each one of those can have a pitfall. So let's look at some of the responsibilities you share. Well, safety is the number one responsibility, both personal and safety of others. So we all of us share that responsibility to keep each other safe. We watch each other's back. And I can tell you right now, um, I don't know what's on the other side of this vehicle, but it's a very, very, very dangerous situation if they do not have that vehicle on the other side braced. Another thing, too, is the people that have the right, right protection are the fire service. You can see a black helmet. Um, they have their helmets on. They have their full turnout gear. And then you have a person in what appears to be blue or purple. It looks purple with jeans. He's not in the right um, protection to be close to that vehicle. So once everything's safe, you do the patient assessment and apply the appropriate emergency care to this situation. You transport and provide care and route to the hospital. This is medical direction. It can be a physician or a specially trained nurse called a mobile intensive care nurse. A lot of times um, physicians don't have the time to be able to get on the radio and give you directions. So they use what they call an MICN or a mobile intensive care nurse. Um, but medical direction, the nice thing about it is 
it takes away a lot of the responsibility from you when you're doing uh, treating a patient. He'll, he or she, whoever the, the, the doctor is on the other end, will give you um, the right, um, right type of treatment for that patient's um, problem. So as long as your assessment is c complete and accurate, um, he or she can give you the right, right treatment. Now, transferring care, so you as the EMT and your partner will transfer the care to the physician or a nurse or a, another medical professional of equal or higher training. So when you transfer care, you give a complete report to the gentleman on the right, who I'm assuming would be a physician or a nurse. Records and data um, collection are extremely important and accurate. And the reason for that is, is you're probably at some point in time going to have a case like happened the other day. Um, I got a call. I was at Knott's Berry Farm with my son on my birthday. Um, an incident that happened. Um, and it was a, a real mess. So data collection and, you know, your documentation has to be pristine. And it's very easy to do. We have a good formula for that. And there's plenty of stuff in the My Brady Lab to help you with record keeping and how to do it appropriately. So at the designated point, the MT meets paramedics, uh, give an update on Ben. Um, the ALS team sounds like they're going to be doing an assessment and treatment themselves. And they're looking at Ben because he has a slow heart rate. So Ben... Ben may have had an episode where the heart slowed so fast, I mean, excuse me, heart goes so slow that it doesn't perfuse the brain. The other end of that, the heart can go so fast that it also doesn't perfuse the brain. And when we get into the cardiac section, I'll give you the more pathophysiology for that and, and why that happens. But with a diabetic, um, anything can happen um, um, to them as their cardiovascular system. And we'll go through, you know, in depth, much more in depth about, you know, what goes on with their uh, inside of them. So if somebody is becoming conscious, they don't know they were scraped up off the floor in a route to the hospital, you're going to be doing some explaining. And in a delicate and kind way, because they're going to be a little confused, it's like coming out of the fog gradually. So just, you know, some people come out of it and they're a little um, ornery and some of them come out of it really nice. So your interaction with that person becomes extremely important um, in at how um, they're going to perceive you as caretakers. So um, personal attributes. I want to think about patience, kindness, empathy, um, having that for a patient. Uh, that kind of patience, maybe a little bit, um, might even be a little belligerent, you know, because they're so kind of mixed up in their head coming out of being from being unconscious. Uh, it might take them a while to get um, back to a norm. And, and just remember that um, seizure patients are similar also. Please look at these professional attributes. They're super important. Um, when you're out there, you know, um, on the line taking care of people as an EMT student or as a professional when you're finally out there, is all this stuff is extremely important. Your appearance, your knowledge, keeping up your skills. Um, physical demands, meaning you need to be in some decent shape. Your personal traits will carry you a long way as being kind, empathetic, and helpful. Um, leadership ability, uh, if people aren't leading and you need, you know, to get from point A to point B and no one's helping you, you might have to take the helm and um, or the steering wheel, so to speak, and be able to get people to do what you need them to do. Good moral character, you're going to be in people's homes. Um, their expectation from you that when you're going through their medicine cabinet or wherever they might keep their medications or you're not going to take anything that doesn't belong to you that you're adaptable, um, situations you might get put in can be pretty um, crazy at times. 
the ability to listen and respond um, in a precise manner. So if I were to tell you, hey, I need you to go get me some more um, triage tags and that you're going to be triaging, you know, these certain people in a certain area should be able to listen and, you know, apply that. And then cooperative, cooperative with everybody on scene, no matter what. And then you have to maintain your certifications. Um, your certifications are every two years. Uh, you have to renew them. I renewed, just renewed mine, both of mine, not too long ago. So in and out to the hospital, they're going to continue the treatment. They call in a report and continue to reassure Ben and monitor his condition. And Alexis begins a preliminary paperwork, which, you know, it's a legal document. Um, you need to know what mechanism or what may have caused the problem um, for that patient. Um, all our medical care reports have, they all say the same stuff, but they're in arranged in different ways. So you might start off with patient's age, date of birth, name, uh, male, female, height and weight, and then go from there. Um, what you know, chief complaint, what treatment did you apply? Um, what kind of history do they have? Well, all that type of information is standard within the medical community to assure that that patient gets the right amount of treatment for what their problem is. So every EMS system has an overall medical director and then a medical director for each. For example, fire department, our fire department has uh, Todd Hanna. Um, AMR has um, several of them. Dr. Chu is one of them. I forget the other guy's name. He's new and young. He's from the military. But anyway, um, and they provide both indirect and direct medical um, um, decision making. For example, you need to know what online and offline medical direction is, and standing orders. Um, that's usually a national registry question. And we'll go through those. Our medical directors, uh, and I'll talk to them about them in a little bit. Our medical directors participate within the county. All of them have to come. We go every three months. We all sit together, all the medical directors, myself as an EMS coordinator, um, all the nurses at the hospital that are involved in EMS in the emergency department and the county EMS system. Um, we all get together and um, do quality review and see about doing system enhancements within the um, our system. So here's how quality improvement works. Um, this is, again, um, a good one to kind of look at and know. So quality improvement starts with documentation. Um, we do um, reviews and audits. We do skills maintenance. Um, the state says you do every two years. Our department's every six months. Um, I work it in, so they think they're only doing it once a year, um, which is twice as much as what the state wants. But my my thing is I really want you to have your skills where you can do them in your sleep. My suggestion to you is when you're doing your skills is practice them as much as possible. To practice them until you're sick. Practice them until you do them in your sleep. That means your blood pressure, your pulses. Check different people's pulses because they're a little bit different on you know, um, sometimes a little harder to find on a young lady than it is a guy. Um, and be able to do as many of, of those as you can. Do your, um, I believe you're going to be getting a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff. Take it home and practice on your mom and dad, brother, sister, you know, whoever you can pay <laughs> your family to do it. But do it until you're sick. And the reason is that goes with everything that you are going to learn in this course because I'm telling you, if you don't do it a bunch of time until you're sick, um, what's going to happen is, oh yeah, I've done it three times. You know, I know it. You're going to get out on a on a on a major injury TC, and the captain's going to look at you and say, hey, you need to take these two patients and give me a complete set of vital signs. Then all of a sudden, you're like freaked out. And, oh, how do I do this again? And you know, start messing with a cuff. And so if you do it a ton of times. In that situation, it's going to be second nature. Trust me. Been there. 
done that. So anyway, patient safety and high risk, um, transfers from one provider to another. Um, sometimes you can have a drop of communications. Communications with other providers, uh, meaning that um, within your own structure, if somebody doesn't quite hear what or get what you're saying. Carrying and moving patients, we don't like to drop people and that can happen. Ambulance transport destinations have to be precise for the patient's needs. And then spinal immobilization restrictions, we've changed how we do things now. We don't spinal immobilize everybody anymore. So you have to be precise in your assessment and be able to say, yeah, that person doesn't need spinal immobilization. Errors during patient care can cause harm and usually result from these three things, improper skill performance, not following the rules, and lack of knowledge. So those are the three that we have as far as patient safety things. Those are the three that we have found within our system to be, you know, at the forefront. And it looks like the National Registry is saying the exact same thing because that's where this has come from. So know that improper skill performance, not following the rules and lack of knowledge. So these are what happens, you know, to the poor patient when somebody is like, you know, oh, I've only practiced a couple of times my use of putting on a traction splint. You know, oh, I got it down. I've done it twice or three times. Now you get out in the field and somebody looks at you and expects you to put it on while they take care of some other people and you don't do it properly. So I think you get my drift on that. We're using evidence-based medicine now um, to whether it comes to procedures or medications and equipment. We want to make sure what we're using and what we're doing, all of it works. And this is how they formulate, um, you know, their their decision making, their evidence-based stuff. You formulate, search, appraise, and change. You know, take a look at this. You know, see what they're doing as far as this goes. It's basically trying to tell you that. We really want to start doing things the right way. We want to do research. Um, notoriously, EMS has not done research. Nurses and physicians do a lot of it. And then we have not, on the EMS level, been doing it. Um, it's only been the last 10, 15 years that Baxter Larman and those out of UCLA uh, have been pushing us. Um, I ended up getting published in 2000 or 2001. Uh, research. So they're gigging a lot of us that have been in the system to start doing it. Um, and then you're probably going to be encouraged to help participate in the same. Um, you might be doing evidence-based stuff as far as um, what we've just done now. Um, we used TXA, which is transamic acid. Uh, we did research on that. Um, our teams were all a part of that. Um, at Hemet and uh, thanks to AMR, they jumped in on it and a couple other departments decided they wanna participate. Well, now we have a medication that when you're traumatized, we can give it to you and it'll help keep you from bleeding to death. So it has increased our save rates by 20, I mean, it was 26%. More people do not die because we give them the TXA and that's gunshot wounds, stabbings, you know, you name it. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's really awesome. So in evidence space, um, we, we develop the protocols, we follow the protocols, we look at the outcomes, uh, we look at every single case, and then we're gonna end up publishing, you know, the results. So Ben looks like he has a cardiology issue. Um, and yet, because he does have the risk factors, anyone with diabetes has a risk, risk factors of cardiovascular disease. It's just the way it goes, unfortunately. Um, more so for those that don't take care of themselves or take their disease process, um, like, seriously. So what they're asking you in this is, you know, what things can you know, we do to help people what are some of the public health efforts to decrease the illnesses like Ben's? Well, if it's a type 2 diabetic, you know, controlling your weight and reducing, um, you know, your weight for a type 2 diabetic um, is a big way to end up getting off of insulin. 
or off of an oral, what they call an oral hypoglycemic. So what role could you do? Well, you can, you can talk, become a content expert, and talk about it, um, or be able to give lectures about it. Um, I'm asked every so often to do that. And you will too, you're no different. You'll end up being able to go out and be able to talk on these subjects. Oh, and by the way, um, your family's gonna, once you become an EMT, you're gonna be, your family will start seeking you out on medical stuff. Um, just be advised. Um, I, I frequently hear that, um, and good. That's good. Good for you. If you you know, want to be able to share with your family, you know, preventative stuff, that's really helpful. Or um, be able to, you know, when you're on a family outing, be able to help somebody that's stung by a bee and has an anaphylactic reaction. Um, now these are. Again, the 20th century, the greatest achievements, vaccines, they still, I mean, there's a big, always a big issue about vaccines. Um, I can only tell you that they've worked. I see them work. Uh, when I was a pre-med student, I had immunology at Cal State. I'm probably one of the foremost immunologists around, Dr. Yamboa. And, but again, there's still people that don't believe in them. But if you look overall, see how many People don't have polio anymore, um, which used to be, when I was a kid, a common occurrence. People um, debilitated from polio. Um, so all these, you know, these five things right here are um, extremely important when it comes to um, health achievements and reducing mortality rates. These are the next, next ones. Um, Fluoridated water when it comes to drinking um, and um, water and being able to get stronger teeth supposedly has reduced um, cavities in kids. Um, and oral health is another thing too. Um, they seem to equate now people that have poor oral hygiene, don't brush their teeth, have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, it's time for a break. Let me go ahead and give you a break and we'll get back to it here in just a few minutes. You have 10 minutes.
Lou. Okay, here, yeah, figures, something different address, email address, Bailey Kinsey, and it's K-I-N-S-E-Y, K-I-N-S-E-Y, underscore B-A-I, L-E-Y, at yahoo.com. Okay, everyone ready to go? Alexandria, are you there? Hi. Hello? Hi. Hi. Ready to go? Hi. Okay, I'm going to start at the top of the list. Alexandria, Aston? Yes. Okay. Um, and what are you uh, what are you taking EMT for? What pre or what goals are you looking for? Mm, uh, well, a friend of mine took the class and she introduced it to me, and I thought it was a good pathway, a door to be open to get into the medical field. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh. Yeah. It it can you know generate you know a lot of different opportunities for you. <laughs> Okay. Okay, Antonio. Excuse me, Anthony Perfecto. You there, Anthony? Hello. Hello. Yeah, there's some feedback from somebody. Every everyone mute, and then Anthony, if you, you can go ahead and talk. Yes. I can hear you. Perfect. And, and what are your goals? Uh, my goal is just to get some experience in the EMT field, like medical-wise. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. You're looking for just anything like ambulance or fire? or to get some knowledge. In that. Perfect. Okay. That's good. That's a good stepping stone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is Bailey. Currently in crisis intervention, so they're having us take it up to the next level with EMT and all that stuff. Wow, yeah, yeah. There are jobs all over, even in Montana, there's jobs all over for that. I'm, I, I, guess, I wish I had went that route. Yeah, and I got your, your uh, email route. I saw you gave me the right email, so I'll resend you that invitation. Perfect. Thank you. And my, I have a question. If we have questions, should we save them and type them in an email for you or just wait for you to respond in the group chat? Um, yeah, either way you want to do it, you can send them to me in an email. I'll give you my um, uh, better email. Actually, let me ch group chat it. It's a Durbin 697 at aol.com. It's kind of easy. Adurban697 at AOL.com. You can use that one. Uh, you can also text me. My phone is 951 316 1727. It's an iPhone for text. Um, I like communication, so if you're having a problem or a struggle, you can give me a call, let me know, and see what we can do about it. My goal is that everyone in here is successful. 
because at some, you know, I'm like getting ready to retire at some point in time and I need, I need you guys and gals out there taking over. And like I was telling people before earlier, um, people are retiring left and right my age. They're getting out um, and even younger, actually, uh, out of the field. And that means that's an opening for you. So if you're, you want you to be successful in this class and pass the national registry and get out there sooner, the better. So that way you can get the good jobs. So anyway, and there you go. So I like communications. Okay. Next is Brandy. Hello. Hello. Hi, Brandy. Hi. Hi. And what I, uh, I think you need to turn the volume down just a little bit on yours. It might be what it is. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, and what are you looking to do, Brandy? Um, I'm looking to get uh, my license for EMT. I already have a CNA license, so I would like to add another one to have more medical experience. Perfect. That looks really marketable. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, Brittany. Hi. Hi, Brittany. And what are you looking to do with your EMT? Um, I'm lo looking to get my EMT, so it's a step in stone to get my RN. I'm currently a phlebotomist for UC San Diego in La Jolla. So they have a program. If you're an ER tech, they will work with you to get your RN. Awesome. Oh, that's a good stepping stone. Yeah, you get, all, get to see all that good stuff in the ER, too. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Chikoya, is I'm pronouncing that right? Are you there? Let me see if I can these. Yeah, yeah. Am I pronouncing that? Chikoya Riley? Am I pronouncing that right? Are you there? One moment. Oh, okay. Do you have a microphone? Are you able to talk, Chikoya? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. I don't know. Um, I'm in the app. And I was having a hard time working it. But yeah, you're pronouncing it correctly. Okay, awesome. And what are you trying to do in life? Where are you going to get with your EMT? Um, I just wanted to get some practice in the medical field, and I hope to um, get my RN later this year. Awesome. Great. Yeah, I know. They're telling everyone to go. Um, they're telling PAs that. They're telling doctors that. I have a couple of EMTs that became doctors, um, uh, actually, recently. Um, and, yeah, it, it's the greatest stepping stone there is. Uh, it'll tell you whether you really want to do it or not, me be in the medical field. Okay, so thank you. Um, Kobe, I know you're there, Kobe. I'm here. Yay. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good, awesome. So, and what are you heading towards? Um, practically just some work in the medical field and as a stepping stone for firefighting. Good. Yeah, you have to have it to get that direction. Okay. Uh huh. Dallin, are you there? We have a Dallin. Yes, sir. Hey, awesome. And where are you heading to? Um, I currently am already a certified firefighter, but I am taking the class to reach the next step and getting hired. Great. Where are you working at now? Um, I'm not working right now. I was working at Harris as a first responder for a little while, but oh, yeah. um, 
yeah. had decided to come back and, and actually finish my schooling so I could move on with the, uh, the process. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We ha we'll have a guy come from, um, oh gosh, one of the um, schools for, um, for an academy. I'll have him come and talk to you guys um, at one of the skills, skills nights. Mm -hmm. probably, probably about halfway through. And yeah, my friend um, who actually works for Hemet Fire turned me on to the program here. So um, that's how I heard about the program. Well, who do you know over there? Uh, Daniel Hayes. Oh, yeah. Tell, yeah, tell Daniel I said hi. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no. he's on an extravagant uh, vacation right now in New Zealand. So yeah, maybe he'll find some hobbits. <laughs> 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 he went and visited that spot uh, uh -huh. just yesterday, I believe. So yeah, I would. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Of course, Francisco. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Good. What are you heading towards? Uh, so right now, I currently work with the, the U.S. Forest Service, and uh, so I'm just looking forward to obtaining my EMT so wow. I can uh, just further my career in fire. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Okay, Garrett. Garrett Caldwell. And okay, we'll move on until he, I don't think he may not be on. Um, Gino. And look at attendees. We have Gino's here. Nope, no Gino. Josh, I know Josh is on. Josh Leedy? Hi. Hi. What are you trying to get uh, as far as... I, uh, I'm going to pursue a firefighting. I'm just taking the first step to get him as a volunteer. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, they're running out of EMS and, and fire in droves. So you're going to yeah, time this. It's a shame that you're not. Yeah, Sorry, I, it's, it's a shame that you're not teaching firefighting anymore. Yeah, I know. I know. But about time to retire. It's getting there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is the, the step for those that are fire. Um, yeah, once you get your EMT and then you. You you need to get about a year's experience or a thousand hours and then get into medic school. Um, hopefully, not too much longer. We'll have our program up and running, God willing. Okay, Josh Martinez. Yes, hi. Hi, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Good. Where are you headed to? As far as your um, I'm also just trying to transition from uh, forest service firefighting into like county or city firefighting and mm -hmm. uh, just open some more doors, um, add to my resume, and just get my foot in the door with um, the EMS service. And Perfect. Move on. Yeah, wherever you can get in, get get the uh, experience is what you want to do. Um, that's for sure. And I don't Thank see. You. Thank you. I don't see Cammy McCallum on. Um, Nash McDonald. Yes, sir. And where what do you head to as far as a career? Uh, so my my end goal is law enforcement. Perfect. Um, I think EMT would be a good way to sort of because they're both very stressful jobs. It'd be a a good way to introduce me to yeah. uh, that part of the job as well as be able to work well with other first responders and uh, possibly tactical EMS on the SWAT team. Good, good. We can, we can talk about that too. Um, I spent 15 years at Riverside County or Riverside County uh, Sheriff's Department on their SWAT team and um, as a level two reserve deputy. So got a little bit of experience there. So I can give you some hints on that. So awesome. That'd be great. Yeah, that's a, pers that's a good way to go. And I can give you some names too um, in the area. Um, let's see. Cammy's not here. Nash uh, Nicholas Bailey. 
Hello. Hi. Yeah, what you heading towards? Hi, how are you? Good. Awesome. Uh, currently, I'm just going for my PA. Excellent. Yeah, we need more PAs, that's for sure. You can write your ticket up north, um, especially or out of state. That's <laughs> they need them everywhere. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about going to Carolina. They got a basic the paramedic program, so get me there a little quicker. Yeah, no, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, sounds good. And Nicholas Sands, did I say that right? Sands. Okay. And Rich Trujillo. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. And where are you heading towards? I'm looking uh, to head into fire, fire. actually. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Fire is perfect. Um, again, yeah, same thing. You need, you know, you need to get that experience as an EMT first. What makes you a, a little bit more marketable um, in California is having the medic. So, yeah, sure. yeah, for all of you. Okay. And Sophia. Yeah. Hi, Art. Hi. And where are you headed towards? Uh, hopefully fire, but first uh, EMT then paramedic. There you go. Yeah, that's that's the best stepping stone. Um, and then, yeah, usually, uh, and I'll, again, I'll have somebody come in and talk about academies and whatnot. Um, and hopefully it'll, that'll be able to get you pointed and push the right direction uh, for you guys. Great. Uh, Wendy, Thank you. you're welcome. Wendy, are you on? Yeah. Hey, Wendy, and what's your head towards? I'm going towards fire. Okay, good. Good. Um, so you're kind of in the boat with all the rest of them. So same yeah. to you. Okay, great. Uh, and Daniel, I know you're on. You around, Daniel? See if Daniel's still there. Sometimes people get knocked off. Push a wrong button or something. Yeah, I think he got knocked off. Okay, well, that's fine. Okay, that's everyone. And then uh, we have Jeff on. He's uh, um, got a wealth of experience. He's doing it for um, his continuing education. Uh, known him for 20 years, Jeff. Uh, um, and you're just keeping your your stuff, Jeff, for um, DMAT or did you only take on? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So yeah, you no, yeah, just for uh, my, you know, I'm with the San Bernardino County SAR team in, in retirement and also with FEMA. Excellent. So, okie doke. Okay, we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and finish the rest of this lecture and start in another one. And again, I'll give you about an hour of, and then we'll um, take a break and I can field some questions on either the chat or the uh, on email or text. And okay, let's see. Hamilton Mountain. Well, Hamilton. <laughs> You're from Hamilton. Okay. I live. In low low. Neighbor. <laughs> okay. Let's get back to it. Uh, slideshow, current slide. Okay, so this is what you might find yourself participating in. Um, something I I do every year, these one or two events a year for, I mean, it can be CPR. I just did a CPR class today, actually this morning. Um, it can be anything. You can be helping taking blood pressures. You can um, doing health screenings with the county and stuff. And it's just anytime you can react, you can be with the public and 
get to know people. You never know who's staring at you or whose blood pressure you're taking. Um, so it's really the more people you interact with and, and a really nice, good interaction, and they see that you've got the bite to want to help people, um, you'd be surprised who you're going to meet out there that might help your career. Um, and we're really good with the disease uh, surveillance. You're, you can be used for that. Um, if there's a, an epidemic or a pandemic, you will probably be helping out um, as EMTs with the um, health department. When you get your EMT, you can apply to the state to become one of their volunteers um, as a, a state EMT provider. Um, medics can do it too, but um, it's a volunteer position. And if it's if you're called up and it's actually declared a disaster, like a you know federal disaster and stuff like that, then you'll end up being you should be end up being on the paycheck uh, for that. You correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jeff, but that's what's my understanding from the state. <clears throat> okay, and we educate kids. We like to see if we can get them kind of pointed the right direction as far as being able to interact with us and not be afraid and to maybe look at that as being a career. Mobile integrated healthcare. Um, what I can tell you about this is um, San Diego has been doing it for a little bit. Um, I started a certain fire department that were naming that I worked 14 years with. I got them a little more than a half a million dollar grant. Got them all kinds of um, good things, meaning um, sonogram machines, um, 12 lead EKG machines, um, supercomputers for documentation and video line directly to a certain um, large um, HMO. And what they were to do is go out and to the public, taking care of people that are post-discharge that uh, for like when they had open heart surgery or pulmonary issues or heart issues and to keep them from rebounding back into the hospital. Also to go out and just get help underserved people that have a hard time getting to the hospital to go out and check on them, doing well checks and stuff. But anyway, and I'm not going to have you read all this. And what it is in a nutshell is that you become a paramedic and then you end up adding a little bit more to your um, things that you can do as far as assessment and treatment. Um, what I used was the PA book, um, Bates PA book, physician assistant book, what's used for all PA, pro, most PA programs. And you learn more in depth um, pathophysiology and assessment. And then you take that as a, 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 a paramedic. And typically we take paramedics have been at least out there for two years and take that paramedic and then we'll send them out into the public on one of our units and um, interact with people that are ill or injured post-discharge from the hospital and to make sure that they um, don't rebound into the hospital or end up getting worse. So you do a complete assessment, report all the vital signs and, and everything to your supervisory physician, for example, Dr. Wong at Kaiser, and then he would direct you at what to do with that patient. So it really is, it's an awesome program, and it makes a big difference in the health of people that are either underserved or have a hard time. They don't have uh, a lot of relatives that can help them in their healing process. And it's really you really don't, uh, you know, out of out of hospital care um, is is one of those places that some people just don't have the resources for them. You know, depending on what kind of insurance they have or, or don't. OK, so um, and I basically just said all this. This is one of the, the vehicle they're showing is one of the ones that. We use, I actually got big um, Ashley Suburbans because they carry a little bit more um, of the equipment, safer. Okay, and they talk about Ben being discharged um, and him changing his lifestyle. And that would be a good thing if people would all do that. So as far as a summary, we looked at the EMS system on a whole and then its components and the effects that NHTSA has and DOT 
um, the agenda for the future and how that agenda is driving what we do as medical professionals. Um, from 911 entering the system to you arriving on scene and getting them to the appropriate hospital, that didn't happen in the 60s and the 70s very well. Um, it's doing really good right now and it's going to get even better. And all of you are going to be on, a, on the cusp of that, either as a physician assistant, as a nurse, if you work in the emergency room, which that's where I prefer because I did that for 18 years at Hemet's ER. And you get to see all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so, um, so no matter what, you're, you're, this is going to touch you and be able to help the public. EMS is going to change. It's going to keep changing. It's going to ever evolve. Um, we're part of public health, not just the emergency first responder system. And the integrated paramedic um, and EMS into those that are underserved is going to continue and get even even uh, more and more uh, things to do for the public to make a difference in their survival and health. Okay. So I'm going to open up just for a few minutes. Any questions if you have, again, you can always Type them to me. Yep, been to Victor Steakhouse. Definitely good. Um, and Lolo Steakhouse is good too. A little private thing here. Um, anyway, so if you um, haven't, you know, kind of caught it, I mean, you watch the ambulances and the fire trucks go down the highway and the byway. Um, a big component of, of what we do, too, is hand holding. It's not everything is an emergency. You think every time we go code three that it's some really super exciting thing, and, and it's not. You know, you have to really have a heart for people um, and want to be able to help people, um, even some that kind of don't, you know, don't really are embarrassed to ask for the help. Um, trying to make them comfortable with you. Uh, assessing them and treating them and being able to get them what they need. Um, so the EMS system on a whole is kind of evolved um, unknowingly back in the 70s. We didn't realize 70s, 80s, when the 911 system really got up and running full bore, that um, it would turn into not just 911, but an emergencies, but also for some basic health stuff which um, we're going to see about the community-based paramedics taking care of um, and leaving the, uh, am the ambulances or fire trucks for more emergent things. So that's going to be something you're going to see in the future in your practice for all of you. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's look at worse wellness and workforce. Just go through a little bit of that. And again, some of this stuff is... Um, I'm not going to go through each, every single slide. Really look at the overview lessons, the emotional aspects of emergency care and safety. These wellness, these three things right here for you and, and us as a whole are super important. I didn't last in this system for, I started as an EMT in 75. I graduated out of Loma Linda in 1978 as a paramedic. And I've been a practicing paramedic ever since. My last two calls I ran a few months ago um, were a hanging and uh, cardiac arrest, which we got back. Um, um, and then uh, uh, a traffic collision with a guy, they brought him out of the car and he's in cardiac arrest, but, you know, I helped work him, but there's no way I didn't think you'd make it anyway, because once you've been in cardiac arrest from trauma, your percent of return is less than 0 0.01, even if you're right next to a trauma center, um, it's not good. But anyway, we gave them the benefit of the doubt. Another case study. Um, I'll let you read it. So now you got a sick person to go on. Very common. Now, I'm going to warn you, sick people could be anything. Um, sometimes dispatch don't get, they don't get enough information. <coughs> um, and not always their fault. Um, that you just don't get it. 
Um, so if when you look at these bullet points, you need to be thinking about this, you know, are there particular issues you should anticipate when responding to assisted living? Yeah, anything, you could be getting anything. You have no idea sometimes. You would think it's a really controlled environment, but I've gotten some really weird stuff at assisted living. Are there hazardous, hazardous situations? Yeah. Um, people, you go in there and it, that particular person may have some type of um, pathogen that you could get exposed to. And then anytime you have a hazard like that, you got to make sure you have your protective gear on. So again, safety first. And you need to be able to deal with not just family members, but uh, the patient, family members, if they happen to be at a skilled nursing facility, those people too, uh, they're human. Um, and then, you know, you must be concerned about, you know, everyone's physical and emotional wellness. So people aren't making dumb mistakes. Uh, they shouldn't be following you in the ambulance real close. Um, so, I mean, just little things like that seems like it's nothing, but yeah, there can be a big consequence for things just like that. Now, in some of the emotional aspects, you need to know these, meaning the five emotional stages. This is always a big deal with, with National Registry. Please know these, the five emotional stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Uh, this is actually from a lady, you don't need to know this. this when you get to nursing, PA, and all that, you will. It's from a lady named Kugler Ross. And these are stages or emotional stages that a patient could go through. But I'm going to tell you something else a lot of times they don't talk about is not just the patient goes through, the family members can too with that patient. You know, um, please, you know, let my, uh, you know, Uncle Fred, you know, die, don't let him die, you know, um, um, bargaining, for example, don't let him die. I'll, I'll go to church every day or something, you know. Or denial. No, no, he's fine. You know, can I bring him? He's in cardiac arrest. You're doing CPR on him and he's 80 years old. He's had 10 heart attacks already. And the, the person that's there going, well, yeah, you know, can I get his pajamas and toothbrush ready for him and I'll pack a bag and you can take it with you. So when he gets to the hospital, yeah, that's denial because the guy's you know, not going to make it or probably not going to make it. So there's not much heart tissue for you to work on. So anyway, just be aware of that. Okay, so see, it says click the statement on the right represents the thought process of a person in the stage of grief, meaning denial. Anyone want to read through this and give me a, a thought? Yes, um, the first one, it says, oh, please. Uh, if you just let my husband be okay, I'll be a better person. Perfect. Um, to me, that seems like bargaining. They're trying to bargain something that they're going to change in the future to settle for something that is happening in the present. Okay, let's push it. This is not correct. Ooh. Hmm. I wasn't expecting that. Oh, denial? Yeah, denial. A person in the stage cannot believe what is happening or is what happening. A statement that might represent this process. No, I can't believe this. This can't be happening. Hmm. Interesting. Go back. Denial. Oh, yeah, this one. I can't believe. Did I push the wrong one? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so, oh, please. Uh, yeah, this is bargaining. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, so no, I can't believe it's happening. This can't be happening. Yeah, I gave you a kind of a different um, example of, um, you know, denial you know, with the lady, with lady packing. And this happened to me. The lady's packing this guy's bags. I'm like, okay. So, uh, and I've heard of, yeah, oh, you know, in, in um, bargaining, oh, you know, I'll go to church, you know, every day or, you know, I mean, the stuff is as crazy as that, but yeah, it, it unfortunately people get pretty uh, pretty wild about stuff. Here's anger. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Um, could number two? Could this one be it? 
Definitely. I think so. Okay, let's try it. Oh, we got it. There we go. So yeah, anger. So they're pissed off at the doctor. Going to sue him. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Bargaining. Okay, I think that's that bottom one we were talking about. Okay. Yeah, let's find the other one. Turn to the quiz. Okay, depression. This one? I read the fourth one. One, two, yeah, okay, there you go. Correct. Can't go through this. Hang up every day knowing I have a few months to live. And then acceptance. Guess that's our last choice. Uh, there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the National Register really wants you to kind of know those so you can see what, where they're at at what stage and be able to help them if you can. Um, and again, people are, can be at different stages. And if you go to page 21, it can list, you know, several ways to reduce emotional burden on some of these people. Okay, I'm going to pass up this one for what's worth today. Someone in kidney failure with high fever and disoriented is in bad shape. So when you look at this, that's really what's kind of going on here. So the fever means bad infection. And in a patient with a kidney issue, it usually um, moves into sepsis, which is kills 25% of the, percent of the people that get septic. So much so now that in the hospital, we in, it started about three or four years ago, we have now a code sepsis. So you hear code blue, um, you know, a, a code blue is a cardiac arrest and, you know, everyone respond to it, me and code team. Uh, code red's fire. Well, now we have code sepsis, code heart attack, uh, code stroke. So this would be one of them. Um, comforting the family, getting them some help, um, you know, having um, some, you know, we'll get them into the hospital as quick as we can so they can get working on the patient. Stress situations, this is what you guys and gals are going to run into is a lot of times long hours or you might pull a double shift. Um, there are some boredom between calls. I know AMR has quite a bit of boredom in their calls because they, um, of how they deploy their units and stuff. Our units go back to a set place and have a response area where they can kind of um, de-stress de and debrief if they need to. Um, working too much or too hard, getting little recognition, and having to respond instantly. For those of you in fire, work, fire service, if you go to county fire or even the forest service, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, my forest service guys, is you can end up on a fire for like a week two weeks. Uh, I've had friends with Cal Fire end up um, not being gone from home for almost a month on some of the big fires to the state. So uh, you, you can't tell me that's not going to stress you out or your family life. Uh, so again, there's a lot of, there is a lot of stress in our profession. Um, you know, you're going to make life and death decisions. That's who you are and what you are. Um, especially when it comes to triage and trying to triage a bunch of different people. Um, being responsible for someone's life, making the decision to work this person and not the other one. Um, you're going to see abuse of children and elderly. Um, and then people, I don't care if you're even nurses, um, caring for infants and children. Some of them have a hard time. I've actually been traded my patients, my elderly patients, and they've given me the babies. Um, not wanting to, you know, they just freak out. And I can close my eyes and vividly see the 18 month old blue baby, arms laying out, limp, you know, all wrapped up. And they, you know, nurse traded me that baby for two old, old people, one having a stroke and the other a heart attack. 
because she didn't want to take care of it. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you, just in your own mind, when you get out there uh, on your ride outs and, and, and doing stuff, is that infants and children, you know, depending on what's going on with them, if they've been, you know, pretty well um, prior to whatever that happened to them, they have a better chance of comeback than an 80 or 90 year old that's having a heart attack or a stroke. With an 80 or a 90 year old, you got to just think that, you know, they've had a long life and their parts are kind of worn out, kind of like an old car. Um, and then you have these little kids where, you know, they're pretty much beginning and their parts are, you know, pretty decent shape. There's only a few things that really get them into trouble. And you as an EMT can actually do quite a bit, believe it or not, to help them out. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, injury of a death or death of a coworker, and unfortunately, um, there have been some deaths of um, people from um, uh, hip, uh, AMR when I was there. I know at least three of them where um, they committed suicide. So um, you have. Three types, acute, delayed, and cumulative stress. You need to know burnout. Cumulative stress is a, is a burnout. Um, so you have these three different types. You need to know those three types of stress. And some of the reactions to it can be on your thinking, your psychological you know, makeup, you know, you're acting a little different, physical, both behavioral and socially. So these categories you see in a person that changes, and it's usually the family that sees it, um, uh, those changes. We have EAP or uh, employee assistance programs to help if we start having problems. Um, it's really confidential, you go get some help. Um, and now there's trained counselors that know your job. Um, a lot of them are retired from the wheel field of EMS and are doing counseling work, they've got their um, psych, you know, um, degrees in psychology and, and psychiatry and stuff like that. They wanted to jump in and start helping uh, fellow people in the field to recover and to be able to um, not commit suicide. Now, avoiding self-medication, that includes avoiding, you know, taking alcohol uh, for your problems. They want you to exercise as often as you can. Um, that that helps. Um, whatever hobby you have, um, you know, do it more. You know, work a little bit less. I know the overtime is really great, and you're know, doing this out and the other thing, but that becomes a bad cycle. Uh, even your diet is actually a healthier diet. It's going to make a big difference in your health, and and both physically and mentally. Believe it or not, I can tell you a diet high in sugar um, it jacks up your immune system. Um, in your family, um, are not going to understand a lot of what you're going through. Um, and there can be sometimes a, a desire not to share or you shared and then they say, I don't want to hear about that. Um, so usually some of the stuff that you've gone through, you may be able to de debrief with your group within your department. Um, they usually have some counseling, at least some group, um, um, counseling of people that have gone through the same stuff. For example, you just ran a call with a major traffic collision. Then we usually try to debrief after it. If it was, you know, really a bad one and, and it had a high stress level, um, it's best to get that off your chest as soon as possible. And they actually give you like an hour or two hours. But by the time you um, get to the debriefing, it's already been that long in fire service because of, uh, of different things. Um, you have to plan to have other units cover you. Um, all our our teams exercise every day, and they're all watching what they eat to help reduce stress. Um, they also might take, you know, their afforded time off. And again, EAP or professional help. Um, it becomes... Um, important if you see any stress that might be affecting a person's work performance is to get them to critical incident stress management or debriefing if it's been an incident. Critical incident stress, um, again, 
there are calls that I've had even to today, and they've been on for a long time. I can close my eyes and still see them. They come up every so often. Uh, but again, you're there. You didn't cause the problem. You're there to help mitigate the problem. And when you, from the time you arrive on scene and start implementing your plan to help someone, whether it's airway, breathing, circulation, you know, the bleeding control, whatever, you're doing something that they weren't getting before. And as long as you know that you're doing it to the best of your ability, that's, that is a step in the right direction for that patient's potential for survival. And, and you just got to realize it's, it's not your, you didn't cause the problem, you're there to mitigate it. And anything you do prior to what they had before is better, is, you know, a step in the right direction. Now, critical incident stress debriefing, and then you have the diffusing. I wouldn't have given you anything for it, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But now, you know, the people that are doing it, um, the professionals are retired firefighters, um, law enforcement, EMS, medics. I, I've known that work for AMR, retired, gotten their counseling um, um, under their belt and their um, degrees and stuff so they can actually do counseling and help people with their stresses which is, I think, really awesome. So now they talk about EMT and disposable gloves. Those are part of your basic protection, and you should always have them. Uh, probably even also with those gloves are your ability to, um, um, to care for your habits that are good habits, um, knowing where your hands have been and where they're going. Um, so you don't cross contaminate, and I'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit. And I'll give you a break here in just a minute. So when you're talking about signs and symptoms of communicable diseases, um, you're talking about somebody with infection, um, open sores, cough, um, might be soiled with either fecal matter and urine, usually not as much urine as is the fecal matter. Um, and any blood that might be in that, in any, any of the fluids, um, are considered a contaminant. Uh, so when you talk about scene safety, we always make sure we protect ourselves with the different types of um, personal protective equipment. And gloves are, are the number one. And we always wear gloves and talk, take, uh, touching other people and following proper procedures so you don't get any cross-contamination on you. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Handling violence, violent property, uh, people that had had violence to them, meaning blood-soaked things, we use put those in red bags carefully and um, make sure that um, if it's evidence that it's not con cross-contaminated with anything else. Now, we're getting more into the microorganisms and I'll, I'll take a break here because I'll, I'll be talking about some of the bloodborne pathogens that we tend to get exposed to or have for that. But if you use your head and your protective equipment, you're not going to have a problem with that. Um, and go ahead and take, I will say, take 10 minutes and I will get back to the chapter. Let me go back to chat. Somebody had a question. Okay. Yeah, thick is smart. Uh, I think my wife applied there to be a nurse. So I think I better talk to her. <laughs> of 
cool. I'm going to have to do this in a way I can actually see these. Hmm. Okay. Let me go on break real quick. Oh.
Okay, let's get a move on here. Boom. Uh. Hmm. You know what? Okay, we're going to get going. Um, let me see if I can bring it over a little bit. There, you can see the whole slide now, and then actually interact with you guys. Perfect. Okay. Okay, let's get going. We're going to, can everyone see the slides okay? Um, I know I have this kind of, thing open on the right of the screen. Um, I don't know if you can see it or not. Okay, and everyone can see. Okay, so we're going to talk some, about something really important. Some of you should have some background on these. Um, 
the primary ones that we worry about are the first two bullets right there. I'm going to kind of leave it open like this. That way I can actually, for some reason, it won't let me look at who's asking questions. So bacteria and viruses are the two biggest um, that we, we face as far as getting um, exposed to. Not as much fungis, protozoas, and helmets. And the last bullet point, the helmets are their uh, worms. Um, and we've had people I've had to help with, you know, cut out worms out of their skin or I had one lady come in and <laughs> three other was like freaked out. Hey, you gotta come see this the lady was coughing and she was actually coughing up worms out of her lungs. So, so, and again, you get people from third world countries that don't have quite the same sanitation as we do here tend to be open to that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, it's very sad, but bacteria and, um, and viruses are what we're going to be kind of looking at. So bacteria are what antibiotic therapy targets um, and usually does a really good job, though there are um, a lot of organisms, um, quite a few of them now that are becoming resistant, and they're looking at ways to try and circumvent that um, and to be able to, they're always bringing up new antibiotics. The problem is a lot of times when they come up with a new antibiotic, it tends to be pretty toxic. So it's better for you to prevent um, getting exposed to that um, pathogen. Viruses, for example, um, are really um, not like um, bacteria in that they um, tend to be very, not very complex and harder to kill than um, bacteria in some cases. And then some of them are, are they're so good at um, being um, evasive as far as your immune system that it requires a lot more um, um, different types of medicines to treat them. And I'm going to, for example, HIV, um, we've become where we're using cocktails now against the virus and it's actually working um, way, way better than what it did, you know, 20 years ago. Um, they have so many new anti-HIV um, medications and antiviral medications now that it's making a big difference in the survivability of somebody with HIV infection. Um, so the particle gets in, takes over your cell, and starts re re replicating itself and using your own cells against you. So Again, some of them are pretty, pretty darn complex, and some of them are very, very basic. Uh, but again, some of them are hard to kill, like HIV. Fungies, typically in the fungies, um, we, the ones um, that we see tend to be more lung fungies, um, meaning coccidiomycosis, um, which is also known as San Juan uh, Valley Fever. San Juan Valley, uh, San Joaquin Valley Fever, thank you. Um, and it's a, a lung infection, especially people who get those that are immune deficient or people that come from back east and have never, their generations have always lived back there. They come here to the San Joaquin Valley or in the middle of California where the spores are everywhere and the dry, dusty climate, you get them down to your lungs and then um, you can end up with uh, a lung fungus of San Joaquin Valley fever. Protozoans, um, you know, things like more often than not, we see um, um, people coming over with malaria, for example. Um, we're just going to start seeing that in this country, in the south, meaning along the border, um, Texas um, in the south. Uh, the Aegis um, mosquito is carrier of it and some other similar types of infections that are protozoan level carried by mosquitoes. And then helmets are different types of worms. We have people with tapeworm in the ER. We've had people with just different types of worms um, and that um, you know, they come in to the ER with them and then we end up treating them and then with follow-up care to their physicians. But in all of these, no matter what they are, good use of your head and blood worm pathogen protection, you're not gonna have a problem with these. 
So protecting yourself and using your head and always using your, your bloodborne pathogen stuff, um, because they're a bloodborne pathogen, it means spread directly or indirectly. Directly means you get blood uh, from an infected person into your, you know, contact with your blood or open sores or into another port, like into your mucosal lining of your mouth or your eyes um, or up into your nose. So, and you don't want to have that. That's a direct contact and a really good way to act, end up getting a disease. Now, for example, this is uh, a, a sore that more than likely be MRSA level sore and means methicillin uh, resistant uh, staph. And that's a boil and that can pop at any time or it could be oozing. And people with staph infections, this one's not doing well. The reason they mark the arms on with the, the, the lines is the swelling. So if this guy doesn't get this under control, not only could he become septic, meaning it getting into his bloodstream, but he can also lose the arm. So um, again, good bloodborne pathogen protection using your, your um, uh, when you're dealing with this guy, your uh, good gloves. Um, as a first line of defense against that. So we have a, a bloodborne standard we're going to look at. And this is how we um, wash our hands. I, I know it seems really simple, but this is actually a question and a number one way to protect yourself is good hand washing. Um, so you w wet it real good, you lather, you scrub, you rinse, and you dry really well. Now, even if you had gloves on and have touched patients with the gloves you, and taken them off appropriately, you still have to wash your hands. It's still required, okay? Um, if, for example, you don't have access to washing hands with soap and water, like on the ambulances or the fire trucks, then you use at least minimum 60% alcohol hand sanitizer and scrub your hands with that really well. And then as soon as you get to soap and water, then you wash your hands. Personal protective eye protection. Um, again, your gloves, and now we're looking at eye protection. You want something that protects from the side and the front. I prefer this type if I'm gonna innovate. It's a mask and an eye shield together. And there are some high risk procedures in which you have to wear both eye protection and mouth protection and gloves. And that's anytime you're dealing with secretions from the patient's nose and mouth, especially if there's any blood coming out of them. Gowns um, don't often, there's only a couple times in which you would wear gowns. One is doing OB, um, a delivery, if you have time to get it on, um, and that to help protect you. And then masks, again, if you're dealing with anyone that you're going to be dealing with suctioning, intubation, or ventilation that may have a respiratory disease. If this person has some kind of respiratory problem, let's say TB, you should be wearing a HEPA mask and he should be wearing a surgical mask. Okay, and these are the, these are, you know, the types of masks. Uh, these are both HEPA masks. Um, N95 is actually considered a HEPA mask, though uh, there's different levels of HEPA protection um, and also an expense that goes with it. Safe removal of gloves. Um, there should be a video accessible to you in the My Brady Lab on how to take your gloves off. Um, and that's extremely important so you don't fling stuff around or get or contaminate yourself when you've taken the gloves off and you got a lot of blood on it. So a lot you got they got their gloves off without contaminating themselves. Anything that has blood like that on it goes in a biohazard red bag. It's required by OSHA. Um, we don't wash 
anything that's soiled with bloodborne pathogen, um, if you don't have the equipment at your department, then it has to be sent out to be specially washed. Um, so some places actually ambulance services will actually have a service for that. Um, and if not, then for example, our department has specialized um, um, high efficiency washing and drying machines for turnouts. Um, and then other departments don't. Sharps containers, um, again, all sharps that have been um, used on your patient go in a sharps container, puncture resistant. And again, take off your gloves and wash your hands. So we clean, then we disinfect. Typically don't sterilize. Cleaning is to get any of the, like if it's tissue, any of the fat off, and then disinfection kills any microorganisms associated with either that tissue or blood or other potentially infectious material. Sterilization is typically for in the hospital. You don't see anybody sterilizing in the field in pre-hospital care. They use a high level disinfectant that's really close. So we really want you to be protected against all these and have your immunizations up to uh, um, current. Um, measles, yeah, I don't know about you, but I've been hearing a lot of talk about measles outbreaks now in the United States. Um, again, people come from third world countries that haven't had their measles protections and some of these other types of diseases. They don't have the luxury of having the uh, health departments we do. Um, so they're bringing them here. And then you have people that don't believe in immunizations in the United States. Now they're passing their measles along to those kids that are not immunized. The older you are and you get measles can put you in the hospital. Um, an AMR medic about 11 years ago got measles. He was not vaccinated, ended up getting measles. Excuse me, it was not measles, it was chicken pox. And he ended up in the uh, ICU for almost a month. He had chicken pox everywhere, in his mouth, down his throat. Um, he was intubated. He almost died. He was 27 years old. So the moral to the story is, you know, you really should be have you know immunized against any of these here. Um, and and uh, again, none of these you want to have for that's for sure. So any of the any report of exposure goes to your supervisor and then the Department of Health. And that's what I do at our department. I did their bloodborne pathogen program. I wrote it. And then I follow the county's guides to exposure control. <clears throat> um, you can't read this, but take a look at this in your book. It um, talks about infectious disease exposure procedure, and it's on target. And you make sure you involve your designated officer. Each department must have one. They're required. For Hep B and C, there are again viral, liver diseases and infections, and it's it's a bloodborne pathogen. So any contact with infected fluids, again, people can be asymptomatic and carriers and still transmit that disease to you. Same with HIV. TB is on the rise again, and they're getting more resistant forms of it. Um, just recently in the paper, there was an outbreak here uh, in a school somewhere, and they were talking 30-something, 60-something people um, exposed. Um, and a couple years ago, it was at College of the Desert where they had 30 people exposed. So, uh, again, it's alive and well. So if you have anyone you suspect may have tuberculosis, meaning losing weight, night sweats, coughing up blood um, from a third-world country, or they're um, HIV positive, street person, uh, they all have potential to have this. So the HIV infection, if they're actually in AIDS, meaning showing the signs and symptoms of, um, for example, kyposis sarcoma, which you don't need to know, it's like an outbreak on the skin. Um, it's a form of cancer. Um, and, and again, you know, they may not, be, have any signs and symptoms for quite a while with HIV infection. So again, 
SARS is another one. There's no lack of bloodborne pathogens or respiratory pathogens. This one really hasn't hit as bad. Um, they were worried about SARS and um, a variant of SARS from the Middle East. It was actually stopped in Canada, according to the World Health Organization. It really didn't affect the United States. But um, MERS and SARS um, are both respiratory. And what they do, um, you, you may or may not have heard of H1N1. Um, and it's similar to these in that it affects your respiratory system. It causes respiratory collapse and actually end up on a ventilator and die. What you never saw in the paper that I knew about is that there almost every every hospital ICU had a young female in first or second trimester if they got H H one N one ended up on it uh, intubated and twenty five percent of them died. So your shot for um, uh, your annual flu shot has protection against H one N one. Um, and you'll get it every year. That shot will have, no matter what the strain of, of influenza is, you're going to have H1N1 in there to protect you because it's not going away, um, according to um, CDC. West Nile virus is alive and well. They found it in Lake Elsinore. They found it in the palm ponds in uh, Menifee. So um, it's, again, a mosquito-borne, blood-borne becomes a bloodborne pathogen once you actually get the disease. You've already heard about Ebola, I'm sure. Um, this is the real deal. Uh, Ebola, we brought some of those cases over here and exposed some of our nurses to it. It was uh, interesting. Um, so they could, the people that had the Ebola that were brought over here could get treatment, adequate treatment. Um, and they're not that many level four containment um, you know, places just hanging around out there that have the expertise along with them to treat people. <clears throat> so a mass outbreak would be kind of kind of nasty. Zika virus, um, again, Zika is spread by mosquitoes. You got the AGs, and I forget the other one off the top of my head. Um, but the Zika virus, um, if pregnant females get it, high potential for um, birth defects. There's no vaccine for it. Uh, for the Zika virus, and it's again similar to how you know you would spread malaria. Zika is the same way. Um, Multi-drug resistant or organisms, uh, for example, like MRSA, um, that means that the drug that we normally would use antibiotic to kill it does not work. Um, so, for example, if you have MRSA and methicillin resistant staph. Methicillin was the antibiotic directed and made to kill that, and now it doesn't work anymore. So now you have to rely on much more powerful antibiotics. The problem with that is, is some of those powerful antibiotics will kill off your kidneys. Um, I had to give a guy a choice. He was about 70, 75, 75 or 80, I don't remember which now. And basically he was dying of a MRSA, he went septic, and the doctor said, I can give you these medicines, but you might lose your kidneys. You have a very high potential for you to lose your kidneys. So you're going to end up on dialysis for the rest of your life. Or if we don't treat you with this, you're going to die of the MRSA. So he ended up taking the treatment, and sure enough, it killed off his kidneys. So he ended up on dialysis. Okay, so take a look at these tables in your book. Um, they're really worth looking at. The transmission mode, the period of incubation, and what you should use for measures. Um, especially when it comes to working in the ER or on an ambulance, you need to kind of keep this stuff in your brain cells. Okay, I'm not going to go through each these two slides. There's a lot on them, but please take an opportunity to look at them. And yes, whooping cough is still around too. Somebody was asking about that the other day. Um, so again, it's real important to be up on your vaccinations. And... Okay. So anyone with a cough and sick with any type of infection and coughing, you need to make sure you have your bloodborne pathogen stuff on. Um, not just gloves, but 
respiratory also. So protecting yourself, um, you should always use your, your seat belts and you will be required in any, you know, to use your seat belts in any ride alongs that you do. Uh, they want you to make sure you have good lifting and moving techniques. Uh, that way you don't blow out your back or hurt your shoulder. We'll see that in the next, next section. Getting adequate sleep helps not only you to be alert and to be, you know, much more um, energized, but it also has to do with your immune system. Um, you know, sleep does help when you sleep. That's when your body repairs itself. And you really want that immune system to be on top notch and working for you when you're out there exposed to stuff. Um, if you're involved, again, with the fire department in any hazardous operations, um, that's only when you're out there as an EMT working for a department, not as an, an EMT student, because um, they're not going to put you in a rescue situation without the proper training and equipment and nor a hazardous materials incident, but you might get close to a violent crimes area. So that's when you want to be really alert and on your toes, stay out of being hurt. It's the cop's job, the law enforcement's job to mitigate um, violence. Um, that's their job. Biological and chemical weapons of mass destruction. There's always a potential for that happening in the United States. There's still a lot of different cells and people coming across the border that are not here because they want sanction. They're here because they want to get rid of you. Uh, they want to send a message. Um, I have plenty of friends in Border Patrol, federal law enforcement, when I was with SWAT, and um, even to today, I know, and some of the stories I'm hearing um, of the bad guys slipping in with all the good is, is, is going to create a real problem here in the near future. Um, and you're going to be responding to some of that stuff, or you'll be a target of it. And when I get to the the chapter 46, um, that was part of stuff I did for um, some of the training for the FBI and the Department of Justice, um, setting up a, a talk on um, bioterrorism. So anyway, I'll give you that lecture because it's spot on. This guidebook um, you'll have access to at the fire department and on your units. It looks like this. It's a emergency response guide. That's the one on my desk now. And this, some of the plaques that are in it. <clears throat> so if you see a vehicle or something placarded, you get an idea of really what's maybe contained in whatever that container is. Um, and it'll let you know where to run, which, which, how far and how fast to run. Uh, I know it sounds kind of funny, but it's true. Now, this is very basic um, level um, protection. He has respiratory protection with an SCBA, and this only goes so far um, when it comes to bad things that might get into your airway. Um, there are things that will defeat this. For example, chlorine um, will eat away and, and defeat that, and there's some other chemicals. Perchlorate, I think, is the other. This is the most protection called a level A suit. And you don and doff this thing, mean putting on and taking it off in a specific way, especially when you take it off and you've been working in hazardous materials. So you would stand by and get vital signs before they go into an incident, once they're totally decontaminated after they get out of the incident. Because being in those suits is not very fun. Um, and you get a lot of, a lot of heat. And the hotter the environment, the worse it is for you. Other hazards you could face, down power lines, um, fire, and changing the direction of the fire, explosion, a primary, more often it's the secondary explosion that was meant for you anyway, um, that could be a threat to you. And then low oxygen environments, um, we have specialty teams to go into um, those type of environments that is not meant for somebody that's not trained. If you look at this slide, um, again, I believe it's in your book. This is a menagerie because not only do you have down power lines, you have fire associated with it, a threat of building there. You have a tanker of something on its side 
Um, so this is like the worst case scenario. And once you have power lines down, you minimum distance, safe distance, minimum, minimum, minimum is 60 feet. So wherever that thing's touching, you have to be 60 feet away from it. Okay. If for some reason one comes down and you're standing there and touches the ground, never lift your foot. You shuffle. No matter what you do, you shuffle 60 feet out of the way. Because if you lift your foot, you're going to have a really bad day. Um, you're going to get toasted. Okay. And I got this directly from Edison Workers. They do the this training for everybody. They actually made a video of, of, of training and how many fire guys that are jacked up or lost their arms or caught fire because they got in contact with this stuff. <clears throat> so now you got wires down, you got a car there. Again, they're working under the wires. Um, the biggest thing is make sure whoever the electrical company is, they have the power turned off. They give you the go to be messing around in that area. Okay, so your visibility garments, you have to have these. This is federal law everywhere now that you have to have high visibility vests, no matter if you're CHP, fire service, um, law enforcement, you have to wear them. So if you're on a roadway and you have to have visible apparel, so you don't get run over. So, and this is what they look like. So you'll have a vest you'll take out with you and a HEPA mask and goggles. So if you're needing those at a scene, you may use those. Um, just let us know. Uh, but you'll check out the, and the, the skills instructors will go through this with you. You'll check out this equipment and um, use it on scene if you need it. That way you don't have to go buy your own equipment, okay? <clears throat> And violence, just remember um, your safety first and the safety of others. Um, you get into a scene, you got called to, like what happened to my guys. There's no law enforcement. They got sent to it, and they were they ended up in a real bad situation. It could have turned really bad for them, but luckily it didn't. <clears throat> they were able to handle it with, um, you know, with the engines they had on scene. So don't even enter, you know, let, wait for law enforcement. Now, clandestine drug labs, um, are you may be standing by at those in case there's something happens. And a lot of them are explosive, especially if they're a hot lab. That's why we always waited until they had a cold lab. And then we did the bus then. Now, I want you to notice this vehicle here. Um, and it says a warning note left by the victim. He did a chemical suicide and he's warning you guys so you'll be safe. And he's in there dead. Um, and this is the one he, this is very, very sad situation. Uh, you probably don't know anything about it, but if you notice he's next to a cemetery, he lost his family and his wife and kids in a, a tragic accident and he became depressed and you know, he decided he would end it all, and he did, and they're buried out there, and now he's going to join them. That was just a total sad situation, but at least he was nice enough to let you know um, that that's what he did and to protect yourself. Okay, so the case study continues with them putting him on a gurney or stretcher um, with the complaints that he already has and you know potential for sepsis and all that and again just be aware of you know your habits like you don't want to take your gloves be working with a patient his sores and stuff and then grab your pen and jot down a note or touch something and cross contaminate something else so you got to kind of you know, think about your habits i've had to wear you know change gloves at a scene you know three or four times because it was that Dirty of a scene. Okay. So, again, they're talking about your well being. They kind of move back and forth um, and really are emphasizing this for you. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, we really want you to be, you know, good cardiovascular strength and muscle endurance. And the reason for that is you're lifting, pulling, pushing, pushing, 
pulling, pushing, climbing um, as an EMT or a paramedic or whether you're with EMS or fire service, you have you have all of the stuff you're going to be doing. And you need to be in really good shape so you don't hurt yourself. So you have good muscle strength, um, um, your core muscles and the muscles for lifting and moving patients. Want to make sure you're nice and flexible with a good range of motion and um, a good ratio of body fat to total weight. Um, so they're starting to look at that. And a lot of fire departments now really are, everyone's giving, you know, physicals and making sure that you're physically capable of doing the job. Um, so they're going to be looking at that. Um, so if you're going to get into where you have to do tests like the Biddle or the CPAT tests um, for you fire service people, uh, make sure you're starting to get into shape now. Um, that you're in really awesome shape before you take those tests because they are, um, some of them are pretty good, pretty grueling. One's worse than the other. I forget who says what now, but um, haven't need to do that in many years. Okay. So if you smoke, you might want to stop, especially if you're going into fire service. That's going to be a big negative against you. Again, and also alcohol and drug related issues. You're not going to go too far with that. Um, stress, you know, find good ways to deal with your stress. Back to our case study, they're using disposable gloves or, you know, take them off, washing their hands, good for them. Um, just remember, in disinfectant, you clean everything um, that patient has come in contact with. Your gurney, your you know everything um, your floors you know, they may not have come come on come in contact with um, okay so they're doing the right thing getting you know being diligent ems workers in summary dealing with death and driving again know the five stages of grief um, manage your job stress by being in good shape and doing constructive things to manage stress, recognize the signs and symptoms of stress, and not just yourself, but in other people, so you can help them dealing with jobs. I mean peers, I'm really talking your peers. Um, and I never, uh, I, can't, I can't believe I never saw it coming in my partner. We had had, we'd worked two days together. We had had oh, quite a few um, very, very bad calls involving abuse and SIDS of kids and abuse and just really bad calls of death and dying and destruction. And the last one was a, uh, was a uh, kid that was abused and with really bad critical condition and came back to the station. She got out, she took all her equipment off and left. And I had no partner for the rest of the day because she had quit. She was done. She was over it. So we don't want that to happen. And I really never saw it coming. Um, she just snapped. So we really don't want to lose people in this field. We want people, to, we want to manage and look out for each other's health and welfare and, and try to get each other help. Um, reducing the exposure to blood pathogen pathogens, super important too. Okay. okay. And these are all the, we really went through all those. Okay. Okay. So any questions before I go on? You can either chat them or type them. Somebody had typed me one on my email I checked earlier. And let me see if I can. Medical legal. Oh, okay. So that's a really good question. Steroid use. It depends on what you're using it for. Um, is it medicinal or is it for building muscle? The problem with steroid use and building muscle is you leave yourself open to um, infections. 
um, steroids, the corticosteroid group, mineral corticosteroid group, like methylone, some of the others, leave you open to infection and easier to get diseases that elsewise your body might um, might be able to fight. Also, um, long-term use has, one, shrinks your adrenal glands, and two, um, has the potential to give a lot of uh, people um, brain tumors. There's a few famous athletes that are using steroids that got, um, you know, to build their muscles and stuff, and I'm getting brain tumors. Phil Alzado was one of them. I think he was a Raiders player. And there's a few others um, in baseball and football. But it always gives you that potential. It really, really depends if it's medicinal or what you're using them for and what type they are um, as far as steroids and stuff. Other than that, if they test you for stuff, they're really testing more for um, drugs, not meaning illicit drugs, not steroids. <clears throat> okay, 8.51. Let me go ahead and give you a 10-minute break here, and then I'm going to start into this, the medical legal stuff. Um, go potty um, or you know whatever you're going to be doing. And um, take ten, and and I'll finish off with a metal legal or get as far as I can.
two minutes.
Okay, let's get going. Let's take a look at um, this last chapter. It covers negligence toward all the medical legal stuff, and I'll delve into a little bit on each one of them. Um, this person right here, they're talking about somebody in a specific, not a good situation. Um, they're a street person that we, you know, you'll find in Hemet in quite a few places and they don't want to go to the hospital. So they, they do have rights um, depending on where their mental status is. And we're going to, we're going to see that. That's what this case study is kind of about and where it's going to point us towards. Um, there's some things that we have to ask. So what our legal obligations are in this type of patient, what's ethical and how much we should attempt to um, obtain that person's permission or get them into the hospital. And again, it's going to base, be based on their mental status. So every call has a legal implication or an ethical decision you're going to make, uh, just the way it is. Um, some of them are really clear and some of them aren't. Um, and then again, you really got to weigh um, what's right for the patient and what a similar EMT would do in the same situation when dealing with that patient. So you have what's called legal duties. Um, you have scope of practice and standard of care. So these are legal duties that are assigned to you to know your scope of practice and what the standard of care in the area in which, um, in which you're practicing as an emergency medical technician. So the scope of practice, again, are actions that are legal and the scope of practice for that state allows you and has you doing specific things um, when you're caring for somebody. And it really establishes, a, you know, a clear, uh, usually a clear line of demarcation between what you do as an EMT and what a paramedic would do, for example. So you have specific scope, what you're supposed to handle, and then they have that are higher up a different scope of practice. It might include some of yours, but then they go on and do usually a lot, you know, a lot more invasive things because it's based on their training. Now, again, scope of practice, you know, defining that scope. And these are what I had said before is that the National Human Scope model um, and education standards are fed into the at a national level and trickle down to states. And from the state, they can even go into a county level. But those scopes of pra practice and those standards are becoming very universal from state to state. Thus, you have a national standard or you're going to be a national EMT, meaning you have a national standard that fits all the United States. Now, when you go to some states, they might ask you, hey, can you we want you to do we want to add to what you're going to do here, not just your national scope. But we're going to train you to do things that are um, a little bit outside of your scope that I, our, our state and the medical director here wants you to do, and that's okay. So you want to ask yourself, or um, or what I would ask is that, did the EMT provide the right assessment and care, and did the EMT perform the assessment and care properly? Um, I'm one of those people chosen by uh, a, a law firm to read through cases and to advise them on cases. Um, I did one in Texas. It was really a, my eye was something else. But anyway, so they paid me like $100 an hour to do that and to, to help them through whether somebody has a case. And what, what I'm doing is I'm doing the exact same as they're asking you on the slide, okay? And then did they have a duty to act? And in that one case, yes, they absolutely, do, absolutely had a duty to act. Um, and an obligation to provide service because they were on duty and had badges and all this other stuff and being paid for it. And then, um, again, uh, duty to act does not exist when you are not on duty in most states. And the reason they say most states, I'm just going to tell you, there's two states in the union that there is some compulsory where you have to stop by law to help. Um, somebody in need, and they start with M's, and I want to say Minnesota and Michigan. Um, it's those states up in that area. Um, 
but and those are the only two that I know I know of. Good Samaritan, just know that if you're doing what you're supposed to, to the best of your ability, um, even as an EMT, it was actually meant for lay public, but even EM EMTs, this was beefed up to protect EMTs and anybody off duty, paramedic, nurse, doctors, it's trying to encourage them to stop and help. Um, and it's designed to protect you if you do stop and help, to prevent somebody from suing you. And again, just do what you, you know, what's prudent and what a normal EMT would do, and you're going to be fine. And that sums it up right here. Now, there is some sovereign immunity that some government employees would get. But again, if it's, you know, negligence and it's totally, you know, what they may have done would be act of commission or not omission. Commission meaning you did it on purpose and omission that you just didn't do it because, you know, you're probably ignorant or, you know, for whatever the reason. Um, you know, you can still, you still may be able to get your, your hide kind of hung out there. So the best thing to do is um, is to do to your scope of practice to the best of your ability. Uh, statute of limitations do res restrict the amount of time a person has to file on a lot of these. Um, contributory negligence means that the patient had a part in what happened to them, meaning that what they did actually contributed to them, you know, becoming paralyzed or brain damage or whatever the case may be. And again, all that comes out in a trial. I've been to a number of them, not just with the Sheriff's Department, but with at an EMS level too. Medical direction is really good in that medical direction. If you get to something and you're not really sure how to handle it, call medical direction. In all states in the union, there's this um, bond, I don't want, probably shouldn't call it a bond, but there's this bond or link, what they call patient physician, um, um, patient physician, I'll call it a bond. Anyway, it has to do with patient physician. When you contact medical direction, you're, even though you're on the, uh, under the auspice of medical direction, once you call them and start talking to them, and they give you direction with the patient, they've taken and you've created a bond between that physician you're talking to and that patient you're dealing with. And um, you've now just given off a lot of that liability you have to that physician on the other end of the line. So it's really a good thing to call medical direction, especially if you don't know or you may have questions. That's a really, really smart thing to do. Okay. So you follow their. Um, guidance on that patient care and again as long as it's within your scope of practice to do they'll tell you to do it okay now you know there's ethics and morals concepts of right wrong and again it's a you know when they talk about ethics they're talking about moral judgments that you make or things that may come up um, when it talk, when you're talking about dealing with patients. So here are your code of ethics that we're, you know, to serve the needs of the patient and maintain our skills mastery to help that patient and that we um, stay in tune with everything that's going on in the, in the, in the EMS world, um, stay abreast of all the new changes. For example, CPR is changing almost every couple of years now instead of every five years. Um, that we really look at our performance and have people help us look at our performance, meaning quality improvement. Um, that when we report, we report honestly, um, you know, what we've assessed and treated the patient. I've actually had people, and again, it's been a long time ago, um, say they gave oxygen and they didn't. Say they gave a me medication and they didn't. And they end up losing their jobs. And it's really important that you're working with everybody as a team um, appropriately. Uh, now they're back to that case study. Um, so when you talk about anyone that has becoming unconscious or altered mental status, those people that are 
unconscious or altered fall into a different category. So if she can establish that person's altered when they were unconscious and now they're you know, telling her to go away, the person you need to know, they need to know their name. The last thing you lose as a human is who you are. Um, and if, if you just know who you are, but you don't know where you're at, time of day, current events or anything like that, by law, you're considered, you're considered altered. And that puts you in a whole different category, which we're going to talk about. So as soon as they can establish that, and if they can't, um, they can get law enforcement there to help establish um, that there might be something under law that a law enforcement officer can do. Um, if they think the person is unable to take care of themselves, there's laws they can use as a law enforcement my partner and I use Welfare and Institution Code 625C quite a bit um, for helping to get people help and, when, and, and things that they need when they maybe knew who they were, but they really didn't know where they're at. Uh, they may knew that it was daytime versus night, but nothing else. And so you're like, yeah, okay, kind of borderline. So, um, and again, call medical direction if you have any, um, any type of question relative to that and then get law enforcement because we really want to make sure that person like it says here that they're confident uh, in refusing care um, as long as they're conscious alert and oriented and not under drugs or alcohol people can refuse your care but we just want to make sure that there's nothing that would sideline them from making a good decision uh, and making the wrong decision so when we talk about consents, you need to know these consents here because they always come up on a test. Informed consent, express consent, implied consent, uh, consent of a minor can get kind of cloudy, and then involuntary consent. So we're gonna quickly go through these. So it, advanced directives are also another way of people giving consent when they're unable to finally from some disease process or debilitating process. And an advanced directive is basically telling everyone what they want when they get terminally ill, cannot make decisions, or if they go into cardiac arrest and there's a resuscitation issue, they're telling everyone what they want, um, want to be done. So in advanced directives, yeah, do not resuscitate, a living will, durable power of attorney and pulse. So the really here, the two big ones are DNR and pulse forms, which is physician orders for life-threatening treatment. Um, so all of these basically are legal documents, if presented to you, will help you um, make a decision on what should happen to that patient, okay? And you have to honor these once you've been presented with them. And it's kind of hard sometimes when you have one of these in in your hands and the person's gasping and taking their last few breaths because that's not we're ems we're there to help people to try and live not to watch them die but people freak out they call us they they present you with this form and then you're looking at this person going oh my gosh and everyone's kind of spun up so again you can always call medical direction and, and say hey we have a Pulse form, it says, absolutely do not do anything to me if I'm dying or going into cardiac arrest. So, again, just remember, best friend, call medical direction. Here's some examples. All the DNRs are pretty much the same. This one's from Ohio. And I know you can't see it on the slides, but you have it in your book. And, again, they're, they're pretty generic. And they basically what they're doing is just trying to make sure you know what to do or what not to do for a patient that's going into cardiac arrest. You don't want to resuscitate somebody that has been dying of cancer for the last year or two, been in tons of pain, and now all of a sudden they go into cardiac arrest and you resuscitate them and now they get to go live another six months in pain. Um, and you know, it's just, it's a bad situation. You know, that patient's really not gonna like you for that. 
Okay, so if the, again, if there's any conflict um, between DNRs or pulse and the wishes of the family, call medical direction. Okay, and that, again, that is your saving grace right there. And any of your, you know, any anything you do, if you if it's unclear in any question, and they have medical direction as an answer, it's probably the right answer. Okay, patients remember have the right to refuse treatment, even if they're going to cause them to die, but they have to have the mental capacity to do so. They have to be know who they are, where they're at, time of day, current event, stuff like that. And if they do, you know, that's basically all you can do. Okay, and you know, I've had to unfortunately leave people like that. Now, if they're having like the second bullet point here, um, well, bullet point at the bottom, they're under the influence of drug or alcohol, you know, that's going to cloud your situation a little bit more as far as what they want. So, if they're dying of a terminal disease, they may be under the influence of drugs because there are now kits that certain people that are dying at home can get mailed to them. They open them up, give themselves an injection, and that's the last thing they'll ever ever do. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. But it requires two different types of physicians, a family physician or the patient physician and a psychiatrist to be able to do that. Both of them sign off if they're dying of some you know, terminal disease. And again, refusing treatment is just getting their capacity to do that, conscious, alert, and oriented, not under the influence of anything that would alter their mental status. So what you want to do is exhaust your attempts to persuade the patient nicely. You do not coerce people. Okay. So when you read through that, you don't want to coerce them. Uh, hopefully they make that very clear. Clearly document the patient's right to refusal, and anyone there that has witnessed that, you know, get them to sign your documentation that, in fact, they were offered, you know, all this help um, and, um, you know, treatment or to take them to the hospital. Again, really be accurate. And, you know, get anyone you can to sign it. Okay, so she's getting the information and trying to make a decision on whether he, he is, you know, oriented. She's asking him his name. He says Mike Blevins. And then she's asking, where, where are you at right now? So she's really going through the process. So Caitlin's doing a good job as an EMT. She's doing her due diligence and covering her, her behind and making sure that the person gets the right place for the right reason. So again, Caitlin needs to know who he is, where he is, time of day, current events. Um, does he have any drug or alcohol on board? And if not, then he can make his own decisions. Look at negligence. You have criminal and civil. And to prove it, you have a breach of legal duty. To create, in other words, creates a liability. So if you have a duty and you breach that duty, then that creates liability. And then you have two types of negligence. You have criminal, which you're doing on purpose. And then you have a civil, which could cause harm. So, you know, negligence is one of those harder ones that the, the criminologist I've worked for um, says it's really harder to prove that. You have tort, which there was no intent to do harm, but there was a breach of the duty to act on that patient. And then these are the elements that are important for you to know when you get a test question that it revolves around negligence is that you have these four things that have to be proven. That you had a duty, there was a breach, patient suffered harm, and that the injury can result of the breach of the duty called proximate cause. So know those four things when it comes to negligence. So, and again, to have all those, everything line up according to this gentleman I work for, um, it's really kind of hard. They don't see as much of that. 
Um, usually if they're going to see something, it really has to do with something that's grievous um, and done on purpose, which I'm sure none of you would do that. And then these are res ipsa liquor. That means the thing speaks for itself. The inappropriate actions are very obvious. A person did something. They did it on purpose. It caused harm. We know that doing that certain thing causes harm. And, you know, you're, you're stuck. You're done. And then there's negligence per se. The act is negligent simply because it violates a statute or regulation. So you've done something that violates some statute or regulation. So I'm going to give you an example. So an EMT decides guy's having a problem breathing, has something lodged in his airway. He's tried, you know, back blows, chest thrusts, and he decides to stick a ballpoint pin in the guy's throat to give him an airway. Yeah, it's kind of, it's not within your statute or regulation. It's not in your scope of practice. So, yeah, it was a negligent act by you to do that, even though they might even have a good outcome. Which taking a ballpoint pen someone's throat, me. Eh. <clears throat> guess it works on TV really good. Okay, so intentional torts would be abandonment. Abandonment has to do with you um, giving that stop, starting to care for somebody as an EMT, and then stopping it, letting a first responder take over. Which really, what you should do is let another EMT, a paramedic, advanced EMT, nurse somebody of higher or the same care level um, take care of the patient. You have assault, and that can outright assault or battery is touching somebody without their permission and, you know, whatever. False imprisonment, don't usually see that, um, meaning you took me in the ambulance to the hospital, you imprisoned me. Um, typically, don't see that. And then defamation, this one is a bad one. The last one is we have a last one is the one we see more than any of the rest. All these others up here, meaning abandonment, assault, battery, and false imprisonments. Yeah, don't usually see that happening. It's the last one that's the bad one. People and their mouths could get them in trouble. Okay. So my suggestion is don't talk about your calls or change it so totally, you know, that no one will ever know who you're talking about. Um, so really, you know, keeping it. And then even that, if you're specific about it, you can figure out by the news. Um, you're Oh, you were on that call. So eh, you just messed yourself up. Okay, so intentional torts. Again, this is the one where you know, you're going to end up going in front of a, either a judge or a, a jury, and they're going to award you money um, for some kind of a damage that you've done to them. Air ambulances or flights. Um, air ambulance or flights, if you give your care off to them, they're usually a nurse and a paramedic. So they're always a higher level of care um, in any area in the United States that I'm aware of. They usually have advanced. Again, just remember abandonment has to do with, um, happens to do with giving off to somebody of lower um, level of care. Yeah, let me go ahead and go into slideshow, current slide, and there we go. Okay, so match the terms below, abandonment. Okay. So which one would you choose? You're going to have to yell out the response because I, I can't see your text. The fourth one. You are. Awesome. Yeah, good job. Okay, let's go to the next. These are kind of fun. Battery. The third yep. one. Yep. Excellent. Yay. And, oh, okay. Duty to act. Let's 
the last one. The last one. Awesome. I think so. Yay! There you go. Ooh, defamation. Ooh, that one gives me the chills. The second one? That's the one I... The first one. For Making statement of um, a person orally or in writing that harms his reputation. One. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, it's the second one. Yeah, I think it's one of... Uh, it may be the first. Second one, I think they're getting asking about HIPAA. Mm. Okay, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. First one. Okay, first one. Both of them are still bad, though. There you go. Confidentiality. So that other one would have been confidentiality. Mm. And it'd be a HIPAA violation. So when they talk about confidentiality, um, I mean, releasing any information that's medical in origin about anything about the patient and the call is a HIPAA violation. And you're illegally allowed to give it to another care provider. Like if you and I are working together, we give it off to a helicopter or mandatory reporting laws like a uh, 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 baby, uh, one of a baby injury being beaten up, uh, child abuse. So you're a mandated reporter. So child abuse, the police, police in an investigation of a crime, you have to give it to them. Um, third party billing, in other words, you're they're billing their insurance, um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or whatever. You have to give it to them. And then subpoenaed, that's by law. That'll come from, you'll get a subpoena issued by a court. HIPAA, I'm going to go back to the other. That way I can see. It's hard to see. Um, hard to see. I'm assuming what I had on there earlier was hard to see. Okay. Um, so HIPAA. Again, this is federal law. Those violations are thousands of dollars out of your pocket if you get caught for that. And again, it has to do with anything that's patient specific. Um, all EMS in this area throughout the United States have, you know, the privacy um, within their companies, the privacy, um, HIPAA privacy training to keep you from getting into trouble. Now, you don't usually see Cobra and Intala, I've, in, at least in California and in Southern California in particular. I've never seen a violation in the last 20 years on that. Prior to that, um, yeah, I had. But you'd be very odd for you, any of you to see a Cobra or an Intala violation. And that's that has to do with, you know, what we call, used to call wallet biopsies. Hey, does the patient have insurance? Oh, no, don't go to the community hospital, go to Riverside General, another 30 minutes away. So they, federal got involved with that and stopped doing that because patients died. So you, I would be, you know, totally, totally surprised. It's kind of like finding a unicorn. Hopefully none of you found a unicorn. Okay, and again, it just has to do with you going, okay, yeah, we're going to take the patient there instead of taking them to the closest facility is really what that's about. Um, and anyway, um, so when you have any types of COBRA and TALA, you make sure you get a transferring physician and receiving physician. Um, that is usually done for you, not by the ambulance crew. It's done by your dispatch. So really, this is kind of out of your hands. Um, you can take and go, okay, yeah, I want to see, you know, the transferring and receiving orders, but still that patient needs to get somewhere quick for treatment, especially if it's above and beyond what that hospital can do, um, you need to take them. Organ donors, um, you are required to look for, if the person's an organ donor, owner, either a card or their driver's license, you're required to do that. I'm required to do that. Medical bracelets, 
um, both the medic alert system um, and or tattoos um, will tell you um, uh, about the patient. Now, as far as medical alert tattoos, not universally accepted yet and may be overlooked as body art. Um, the problem is if they were to say diabetic and put some information like contact information like on a medic alert, make it look more like that. Because if you flip this over, there's a code and a number that you that's tracked and you can get into the alert system or call a phone number, give them that number, and it'll tell you exactly what you can or can't do for that patient. I have a friend that has a tattoo on her chest, um, says do not resuscitate, no CPR and all this stuff. But she was kind enough to show it to him. He kind of took me off guard. Like, okay, I don't even know that. Do you think it's legal? And I told her no, because the doctor hadn't signed it. It has to be, you know, signed by a physician. But whatever. Uh, yeah, so you get, you get to work with interesting people, too. <laughs> you guys are going to love, gals are going to love this field. Uh, uh, so special situations, again, death in the field. You're allowed as an EMT to say that no one's resuscitatable. And everyone seems to have pretty close to the same guidelines, meaning obvious signs of death. Um, um, there's an exception as hypothermic patients are not dead unless they're warm and dead, and we'll cover hypothermia. But we want to make sure that they're warmed up to the right temperature. So again, no one is dead unless they're warm and dead. And so um, signs and symptoms of, of obvious death, the absence of a pulse, totally unresponsive, no eye pupil movement, they're dilated, they're usually dilated. Absence of a blood pressure, no reflexes. Um, and usually you use that also for advanced directives. Um, there's also stuff like post-mortem lividity, rigor mortis, um, decompetition. Post-mortem lividity is the defendant lividity, and rigor mortis is the stiffening. Um, if you have decapitation or decomposition, you don't need an advanced directive. And again, people have advanced directives or DNRs. You might, I haven't seen Uncle Fred, this is very common, or Aunt Martha, you know, in a week. So you go to their home and, you know, you got this stuff going on. So there's nothing you can do about them. They're not resuscitatable. In coroner cases, again, you got to be very careful about um, disturbing evidence. And um, so in a homicide or even a suicide that may be a suicide, any type of violent death, um, crash related or, or investigated also, anything that might be unusual at the scene um, that might render suspicion, um, you might want to let the make sure um, police department is on their way to investigate. SIDS are always investigated and then death on arrival um, in some locations. So we're allowed EMTs and medics in our county under those circumstances where people have postmortem lividity, no pulses, no movement, rigor, and meaning the stiffness. And um, they, they don't have a chance of being resuscitated. Um, now, we don't, sudden infant death syndrome is something that is um, ruled out by the coroner's office. It's not something I look at, oh yeah, they got SIDS, well, no. Um, that is, again, that's a, that's a post-mortem um, autopsy thing. So if you have a kid that is usually, and it doesn't have to be male, but male between um, September, October, and about April and May, um, and usually under the age of one, um, are the higher potential for sudden infant death syndrome. Um, so they usually have purge coming out of their mouth, a little foam with some blood mixed with it, and all the ones that I've had. Um, so basically, they all get investigated in our area, and in most areas, um, they're given an autopsy. So they're trying to get as much information on this still to make the picture clear on sudden infant death syndrome. Just remember in crime scene, we don't send in the, everybody in the world into a crime scene. Typically the law enforcement will say, we just want one person to go in 
you know, and check for signs of death, I make absolutely sure. Um, and again, it doesn't always happen, but you send in one person because if it is a crime scene, they're probably going to cast your soul to your boots and make sure there's no what we call crime scene clutter. Um, you don't turn on lights. You don't um, handle um, anything at the scene. You walk in one way and walk right back out the same way. If there's shell casings on the ground, don't kick them. You don't cut through clothing that have stab wounds or bullet wounds, you know, to get access to the, you know, maybe to the neck or to put patches on the patient, see if they have a rhythm. So anyway, what we're saying is you just got to be very careful and usually have nice to have a cop overseeing what you do so you don't clutter the crime scene because we want to be able to um, find who, if it is a crime, who actually did it, and that they get what's coming to them. So one way in, one way out, tell the pre uh, the officers if you've moved or touched anything. And again, I prefer, and again, don't use a telephone there. They don't turn on the lights or mess with the lights. And it's nice to have an officer overseeing you. They don't put this in here, but in my department, that's what we, we preferred. Okay. Yeah, we already, I already went through that. I got ahead of myself. I think I'd done this before. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, knots or ties. Don't, if someone's hung themselves, don't cut through them. Um, do not cover the patient with a sheet. That's only on the, you know, that's only in crime scene movies. Um, cops will do that if it's out in the public eye. Um, they, they can do that with their own, their own crime scene covers. There's a reason for this. Um, because again, you're disturbing stuff that we would expect to be in a certain place. I'll just, that's all I'll leave it. If it's a rape case, we try to make sure that they don't wash themselves um, or do anything to, you know, it, it's tough. Those are the worst to me, one of the hardest things. And just be really empathetic and try to get them to cooperate. That way you can catch the perpetrator. Um, we'll get more into this in, a little, in another section. Um, and again, you're a band-aided report of child and adult abuse, uh, crimes that are violent against you know people, including rape and you know assaults and whatnot, and drug-related injuries. Um, again, it's related to injuries, not drug use. Uh, we don't report every druggie we come in contact with. We just try to get them help if we can. Baby safe haven laws, if somebody presents a baby to you, say, I don't want them anymore, you're required to take them under the safe haven and baby. Um, try to get their name and, you know, you know some identifying information. And if, if they'll talk about the baby have any medical problems or illnesses or anything. Um, but we had at Station 3 in Murrieta, somebody come to the door, throw a baby in my guy's arms, my engineer, and run. She bolted. And she was still dripping you know, from delivering the baby. So it was a neonate. So, um, yeah, just take them and do a good assessment on them and get them transported to a, a hospital and look at, take care of neonates and make sure they're all right. That's just the way it goes. So in summarizing your EMS medical legal, you know, when you look at that, if you have any questions, you know, let, you know, you can send them to me or text them or whatever. But this is really important that you kind of get a grasp of the medical legal um, aspect. Typically, what I see and have seen in the last 40 years that I've worked in this field is that um, almost 40 years is that um, if you got a good heart, you're there um, and doing the right thing and learning and, and getting better. And people will think you're empathetic and want to help them and you're kind to them. You usually do really, really good. Well, the suits that I've had against EMTs and medics have been EMTs or medics that have poor bedside manner and have the bedside manner of a pig, meaning that they don't they don't um, relate to people very well. You know, hi, what you need? OK, you're not feeling good. Well, what's wrong with you? You know, that kind of attitude versus hi, my name's Art. I'm a paramedic. I'm here to help you if I may. What happened to you? 
two different tones of voice, two different ways of telling somebody you care about them. One is you really don't, and the other is you really do. So, uh, again, I've had a young lady, she was a medic, she would poke somebody six times, and I tell you, getting an IV in someone, getting poked six times and not getting it, that kind of pisses you off as a patient, been there. And um, and then I have another guy who, as a bedside manner of a pig, he'll poke you once the first time, not that painful, totally on on his assessments, an excellent medic, but he got sued more than the lady that was a lousy medic and poke people six times and never get your IV. So I think you get my drift on this. So EMS law is important. If you want to stay out of problems, care for people. Okay. Um, and just if you're somebody is competent and can refuse care, then that's the way it goes. Just document it and be kind about it. Tell them, hey, call me back. If you change your mind, I'll tell you, take you to the hospital, you know, just remember about HIPAA, COBRA, and EMTALA um, and how they apply to EMS. And the one being HIPAA, the most important. Um, remember, don't get caught up in the negligence thing. Um, it's very easy not to. Um, it's really hard to. You'd have to be really, really forcing yourself to get called on negligence. Okay. Um, crime scenes. Remember how to do a crime scene response. Don't clutter up the place. And these are all based on the test we already did. I don't know why the hell it ends up at the end. Anyway. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the question is about yeah the the practice tests and the post and the homework are all posted. So make sure you do your homework and your practice tests. You get points for doing all that. Um, it's possible if you don't do the practice tests and your homework um, to fail a class. So that stuff is there for a reason. It reinforces all this material. Those that do that do well at making being diligent about it. Um, they end up passing the course and they end up doing really well on the national registry. Um, tests. Um, the tests, the real tests, I will put out. Um, they're out at on Fridays, and they ha you have until Sunday night to finish them. Um, so you can take them at any time during there. They're usually 40 questions, um, and they're usually um, uh, there. You get one minute per question, just like on the National Registry. So. A lot of places don't do it like that as far as EMT schools. And then when their students get to the national test, they're sitting in front of a computer instead of a paper test. And the computer gives you one minute per test question and they freak out and they take it and don't do good. And they take it and they don't do good because they're not used to taking a time test. OK. Um, let me. Okay. So that's all I have. Unless you have questions, please have a great night. And um, you have skills tomorrow. The skills instructors are really good. And then I'll see you on Wednesday. I'll have three lectures then. And then you'll have more skills on Thursday. And then um, for your first test coming up, Chapters one through six to be in your um, syllabus. Yeah, chapter one through six, and it opens Friday the 25th, and it goes to evening of Sunday. Okay. Um, is there any questions? You can either chat on me now, you can text me, or you can put it on the, uh, my email, and I can respond to you. But other than that, we're done tonight, and we'll see you later. Thank you. You're welcome. I love the Montana weather. I'll take it over heat any day. <laughs>
Yay, we're going to get a bunch of new EMTs out there. In about 14, 15 weeks, I hope. Ooh, can you send me something? What's that? Okay. Yes, Takoya Riley, I will send you that. I hope. Let me see. So, hope that you have the right email. Chakoy, are you still on, I hope? Chakoy O'Reilly, um, can you tap me your, what I have for an email address is D, it looks like underscore Riley, R-I-L-E-Y, 93 at gmail.com. Is that correct? It's Yahoo. Aha. Why do they have it's yahoo.com? Why do they have Gmail here? Yahoo.com. I will surely do that. The rest of it's right, I hope. Let me go back to check. Uh, D underscore Riley. Okay, uh, yeah. Yes, I will surely do that. I will do that. Hey, I guess I will go ahead and leave too. Let's see. <laughs> 